Hello, saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. Wine and Crime contains graphic and explicit content that may not be suitable for some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Wine and Crime, the podcast where three friends chug wine, chat true crime, and unleash their worst Minnesotan accents. Oh my god, I can pantomime so much more aggressively now that I have a mic on a boom arm. It like follows my face around. It's fucking amazing. (laughs) A Fraser Crane, Crane mic. The official microphone of Dr. Fraser Crane, KACL Seattle. I'm listening. (laughs) (laughs) we're listening to ourselves talk (laughs) for upwards of two hours oh god why do we do this anyway who who are we (laughs) ah fuck i'm kenyan i'm lucy hey baby i hear the blues are calling (laughs) to salads and scrambled eggs I'm Amanda. Oh my (laughs) (laughs) and i got you pegged But All I right. don't know what to do with those tuss <laughs> salads and scrambled eggs. <laughs> all right. But- <laughs> it kills me every time. They're calling again. They're calling again. <laughs> scrambled eggs all over my face. What is a boy to do? So if you can imagine <laughs> can us now. in Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, Amanda, I, when Amanda thought the space needle was just a really... A huge practical joke that was played on her her entire life. The entire universe is gaslighting me into thinking that the space needle is real, (laughs) and I know it's not real. (laughs) An elaborate prank. (laughs) Started by storming Area Fifty One. You want to storm the needle? Storming the space needle. Storm the space. (laughs) Needle. Reveal your <laughs> secrets. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Okay, so we're a little slap happy today. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah. I feel like we've recorded true. every day for the last six Ever. years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lifetime. Hey, <laughs> lifetime. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. But before we get to the topic of this week's episode, we have a couple more butt plugs. Yes. Um So our first butt plug is we want to gather information about you, but anonymously. (laughs) We need help. (laughs) Um, No, it's it's all it's all safe. Uh, We would love for you to fill out a survey about like what kind of shit you like and how old you are and your gender identity and your social security number. <laughs> no, yeah. not that. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, blood type. Uh, oh don't worry about it. Uh, no, I don't know. I actually don't even know all the questions, but they're all like, you know, they're standard above the capitalism. Board. The, and the atten- intention is to get to know our audience better so that we can better serve the audience that we're reaching. Exactly. So Mm -hmm. if you want to help us out, fill out this survey. You know we love a good quiz. Mm. Uh, Go to survey.libsyn.com forward slash wine and crime podcast. So that is survey, S-U-R-V-E-Y dot Libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N, dot com forward slash wine and crime podcast fill out that survey it's free it helps us out a bunch we appreciate it we appreciate you yeah we, we do. do and we're listening we're listening we're here for you <laughs> uh if anyone's caught up on succession Oh, that would have made more we sense. Here we here for you. We here for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that show. Oh, my God. Uh, second butt plug. We got some new merch people and Woo! more coming down the pike. But 
by the time this episode airs, our new enamel pins will be live on the store. Y'all, they're gorgeous. They're so cute, and I love them so much, particularly because they were all designed by listeners just like you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got true, and they're big. They're nice and big. They're hefty. They're They're girthy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I gave a set to my gay BFFs, Robbie and Aaron. Hi, Robbie and Aaron. And uh, Aaron has a massive collection, like several glass case boxes of enamel pins. He loves enamel pins. And every time he gets a new one, Robbie has to, quote, test it for mouthfeel. (laughs) (laughs) He chews So they have been approved, like just one little, one little like mush with his mouth. Well, you know. He's basically a giant baby that's still experiencing (laughs) his surroundings orally. (laughs) No, I get it. Because (laughs) as I went through the process of producing these pins with our merch Mm -hmm. production team, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of different kinds of finishes. There's Mm -hmm. soft enamel. Mm -hmm. There's like a trillion other kinds. So, yeah, these are not soft enamel. They're hard. They're sturdy. They're shiny. They're made out of metal. Mm-hmm. And like I they said, got the nice backers. Didn't you great get the upgraded mouthfeel. backers? Yeah, I got the nice sturdy metal mm-hmm. backing, not the mm-hmm. rubber ones that tend to fall off. Yeah, we spared no expense. These things are legit. Yes. And they are gorgeous. So they come in, there's a set of five, five different designs. They were all lovingly put on a card by me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) what's with me and pins and like a lot of manual labor i know we were like let's do enamel pins so that you don't have to use the button maker and give yourself carpal tunnel anymore we were Um, like yay and then we were like we have to put them on this board and you're going to do it individually each one jokes on me but they do look really good i'm very proud of them so go to wine and crime podcast.bigcartel.com and check them out out and just a friendly Mm. reminder about our online merch store when you first get to the page the items that you see are just the featured products yeah there's a lot more use that navigation bar on the right to see the rest of them because we get a lot of questions about like when are you bringing back your plastic wine glasses it's like Mm -hmm. honey those are never going away never (laughs) ever ever we got them they're there Mm -hmm. they're there we here for you we here for you Mm -hmm. (laughs) until (laughs) trump ends the world (laughs) <laughs> Which could be okay. any minute. All right. So, <laughs> so let's speaking, drink. <laughs> speaking of absurdist nightmares, yeah. the topic <laughs> of this week's episode is crimes that inspired Lifetime movies. Yeah. Yeah, I love the mother this. load. <laughs> this is legit the mother load. My sister and I have a tradition when we're hungover on New Year's Day to stay in our pajamas, order pizza, and watch Lifetime Movie Network for like six hours at a time. Yeah. I'm stealing that. It's I'm stealing that tradition. That best. is now also my tradition. It's stolen. everyone's tradition. It's, it's so great. I just do that on Sundays. Well, true. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. This, is a, this is a good one. Special Sunday. Um, mm-hmm. This is a very special fan pick brought to you by Susanna Scruggs. Mm, I don't Old- want no Scruggs. I know the lyrics to this song, but I just completely blanked for one for one second. <laughs> Scrub is a guy who thinks he's fine. He's also known as a busta. Anyway, thank you, Susanna. Okay. Susanna is no scrub. She's mm-hmm. a scrugs. No. She's a scrugs. <laughs> She's a boss scrugs. <laughs> mm, love it. Um. Yeah. So, what is our wine crime pairing for crimes that inspired Lifetime movies? It's perfection. That's what <laughs> we're, we're pairing this week's episode with Forma de Vida Verdejo from Wink. And you can check out Wink Wine Club by heading to trywink.com forward slash gals. That's T R Y W I N C dot com forward slash gals for 20 bucks off your first box. So, go check it out. But Forma de Vida translates to lifestyle or way of life, which is almost identical to lifetime, so it fits perfectly. (laughs) Don't even try to fuck with this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Tempo de Vida. (laughs) Crushing it. Ah. Uh, (laughs) Nailed it. So Verdejo is one of my absolute fave white wine varietals. So I am so happy so to good. be drinking it. Um, 
Fun fact, this is one of the most popular and well-known Spanish white wine grapes, but it's believed to actually have originated in North Africa. What? Mm. Yeah. It's believed to have been brought to Spain by the Mozarabic settlers around the 11th century. Uh, I I don't know a lot of those words, but I love the factoid. Uh, Another fun fact, this grape is rich in iron and often harvested at night to keep it cool and root to the winery and prevent oxidization. Mm. Oh, I want to be there for like... A right, like a starlit wine Under the cloak of darkness. I mean, mm-hmm. how fucking awesome does that sound? With Keanu Reeves, oh. my fiance that my father doesn't approve of. I fiance just Reeves. <laughs> lost <laughs> Reeves. lost my breath at the mere thought. Of doing a starlit <laughs> wine harvest with Keanu Reeves. Yeah, it's a great I'm movie. I'm shook. But he's like <laughs> surfing inexplicably. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm let me it. finish yeah. so that I can space out. It's and an just excellent adventure. <laughs> sexy daydream about Keanu Reeves. Um, so the Verdejo grapes for this particular bottle were grown in California, where many of the viticultural areas can mimic the cool coastal Spanish like wineries. So it's kind of cool. California can make a lot of great comparable American versions of like Spanish and French wine varietals because it has so many different like climate areas. There's Mm -hmm. like a billion different terroirs in fucking California. It's kind of magical and amazing. Um, This bottle has tasting notes of citrus, nectarine and pineapple and clocks in Mm -hmm. at 13.6% ABV right in the sweet spot. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's going to drink kind of like a Sauve Blanc, except even drier which is one of the things that I really love about it. It's got Mm -hmm. a little bit of like tart acidity to it, but it's Verdejo is super mellowed out with a nice dry finish. It's not too sweet. It's like, I love it. It it pairs with freaking everything. It's so good with spicy food. It's very light. It's very light, but it stands up because of its like nice acidity and it's dry balance. It stands up really well to things like um, paella, Oh, That's like a perfect pairing is Verdejo and Paella. Get after it. Mm. Holy shit. Mm. Um, she's a popper. So if you don't have the tools to get into your wine, head to wineandcrimepodcast.bigcartel.com and pick yourself up a shiny new nice pop wine key. Yeah. To, to serve all your needs. And a Shall glass we? while you're at oh. it. And a glass while you're at it. I love yeah. it. Should we do um, this? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, first pop in front of the brand new microphone. Let's see how much I flail spell and it, spell ruin it, my no. It. Oh my god, no! Don't that's my spill nightmare. over your four hundred dollar microphone. Oh god! Oh god! Okay, here we go. The pressure's on. <clears throat> oh, oh, Keanu oh. approved pop. Hey, baby, oh. I hear the pop calling. <laughs> pop bottles and scrambled wine. Mm. Ew. Perfect wine to wash down that red pill, am I right? Oh, give it to me. <laughs> it's from the, the pill. I really like this Fraser Keanu Reeves crossover. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm here for it. Yeah. All right, Lucy, All right. bend, Cheers, bend some spoons with your mind and tell us about the, ba- <laughs> they the background definitely and don't psych. do that in the Matrix. <laughs> <laughs> they bend spoons with in your the mind. Matrix? The Oracle bends the spoon, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think Keanu Reeves does, though. No, the no. Oracle does. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm like, mm, Keanu Lucy, don't do that. the Oracle. Yeah. Oh. Don't give her the satisfaction. <laughs> God. Dust. It's a dangerous game Dust. you're playing, Kenyon. The Oracle. <laughs> dangerous my, uh, game. My ego is huge. <laughs> <laughs> I can feel the spoons bending. Oh, my God. All the right. earth is shaking. Does everybody feel that? <laughs> it's Lucy's ego. <laughs> Rising like Ursula from the sea. Uh, <laughs> keep singing. <laughs> Okay, way too many okay. other references. All right. A little <laughs> mixed this our has metaphors spiraled here. out of control. We're, we're <laughs> spiraling. All right. What is the background in Psych for crimes that inspired Lifetime movies? Well, 
Before we talk about Lifetime movies, we have to talk about its mother, Lifetime, the TV network. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which has kind of an interesting history. So Lifetime is an American cable TV channel and is a subsidiary of A&E Networks, which is jointly owned by Hearst Communications and Disney. Oh. What? Disney fucking owns everything. Everything. It freaks me the fuck out. Yeah, Disney owns everything. It's terrifying. Mm -hmm. Disney, get at us if you want to own us because we are open to offers. Oh, okay. for sure. But also, I'm Fuck scared. Fuck yeah, of you. Disney. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get drunk and swear. We're right up Disney's yeah. alley. Woo! Disney's yeah. here for it. <laughs> um, so as of 2016, the channel is received by almost 94 million households in the U.S., which I believe was like around 70% of households that have a television. Jesus. Um, no. Not clear if that television Not has enough. to be like hooked up to cable. What with all of this cable cutting, streaming on your fire stick stuff, which is what I do. I personally don't have lifetime. Sorry, there I said it. Wow. I guess I don't either because I don't have anything besides Netflix. You have Hulu. No, yeah, I and you thought can, I had Hulu. Oh, but I have Hulu, and you can get a ton of Lifetime movies on Hulu and Netflix. Yeah, I mean, I have access to all of Lifetime's content. I just don't subscribe to cable because yeah. what a waste of money. And if you're still subscribing mm. to cable, you might want to reconsider. It's so expensive. I, it is expensive, but I am also subscribed to so many streaming services that I know in my heart I'm paying more for that than I would be if I just got fucking cable. The, oh, totally. The, I know I am. The last time I had cable, which was several years ago, it was something like $120 a month. Yeah, I'm easily spending that much on, oh my on God. streaming All services. Right. Well, <laughs> that's, it's her that's main your hobby. <laughs> yeah, I love television, and I'm not uh, I'm not sad about it. I need to yeah. find a way to just have Bravo. All I need is Bravo. Mm, Bravo is so good. Anyway, back to Lifetime. <laughs> uh, so in the mid-'80s, Hearst wanted to capitalize further on alternative women's programming following the success of their channel established in 1982 called Daytime. Mm. Nice. They invented the word daytime, y'all. <laughs> Essentially. <laughs> in Love 1984, <laughs> day, daytime merged with <laughs> Viacom's <laughs> Lifetime Medical Television Channel. Mm, <laughs> okay, I, I would want be here for that. that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that sounds amazing. So absurd. Absolutely. <laughs> so life, <laughs> Lifetime is a combo of daytime and Lifetime medical television. <laughs> it makes sense. LMT. I would have pegged TLC to have something to do with a channel called med medical television. Maybe they were yeah. just taking a page out of that playbook, you know? Yeah, maybe. Well, TLC has really changed its... Uh, Tack. Yeah, big time. <laughs> Ever since Dr. Pimple Popper came on the scene, burst okay, onto well, the scene. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. That oh, is I medical that. and enriching. I hate no. it. No. Ew. It's my favorite thing ever. Oh, my God. I can't. Okay. So Lifetime wasn't immediately successful, losing $36 million in the first two years. Whoops. But a poll showed that a lot of potential viewers at the time thought that it broadcast religious content, and that's mm. why they weren't tuning in. And that could have had yeah. something to do with their logo, which had an, like a heart-shaped apple in it. And if you go to the drive, I have a picture of their old original Lifetime logo. It does we, look like an after-school don't oh, do wow. drugs. It's bad. It's really bad. Wow. That is terrible with the little like heart strawberry thing. Yeah. Oh, it's so bad. That is the worst thing I've ever seen. Yep. So they obviously ended up revising. <laughs> We've seen the logo. some shit, and that is the worst <laughs> thing. Where are the corpses? Yeah. Show me those Russian dolls. <laughs> the mummified dolls. I'd rather have that than this logo. <laughs> Absolutely terrible. Oh god. Terrible. Te it's horrible. <laughs> oh, it's horrible. 
<laughs> so in 1985, the channel began branding itself as Talk Television, featuring a lineup of talk shows and call-in programs uh, featuring people like Regis Philbin and Dr. Ruth. Yes, mm, I love Amanda's Dr. Ruth. Pr- Patronus. Everybody yeah. says Amanda's their Patronus. Dr. Ruth is your Patronus. 1,000%. Absolutely. She is fucking goals. Down to the German accent. <laughs> no. Uh, in 1988, the network hired genius Patricia Feely as its head of programming, who redirected a ton of their content and basically invented the lifetime that we know and love today. She yes. worked on acquiring rights for syndicated shows on other networks like L.A. Law, along with obtaining the rights to carry on shows that had been canceled on other networks and moving that new content over to Lifetime. So kind of like what Netflix has done for a couple shows or like Hulu did for like the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt and things like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like shows that were canceled on like NBC now live somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, she also oversaw the production of the very first Lifetime original movies. Mm. Yes. So she was the Santa Claus that brought us that gift. The mm-hmm. channel also broadcast some women's sports. It established ties with the National Organization for Women, and it began airing PSAs for women's issues like breast cancer awareness. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, so... Mm-hmm. Thus, the channel adopted the tagline, Lifetime Television for Women. Mm. Yep, yep. We serve more than half the population. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we are niche. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, funny you say that. Um, The next couple paragraphs are direct quotes from the Wikipedia article because... This is where I got my information, and I did not have the energy to rephrase it. So this is just quotes. Fair enough. Uh, So, quote, Meanwhile, the channel's original programming was aimed not just at women aged 24 to 44, but also these women's spouses who research showed watched the network in the evenings with their wives. It's assuming Mm -hmm. that these women's spouses are men in this. Well, Back then, they had to be if they were legal spouses. Yeah, but, you know, whatever. Yeah. They're, they're talking about husbands. Right. Um, this was done by making the male characters in Lifetime's original programming, such as the film series Spencer for Hire, never seen it, never heard of it, never going to, more <laughs> appealing to men by making them more masculine. These roles were more stereotypical than previous Lifetime movies, which usually featured women protagonists on their own. This helped Lifetime take advantage of a known bias in the Nielsen ranking system that favored upscale couples who shared a television set. So by Mm. January 1995, Lifetime was the sixth most highly rated subscription network rated by Nielsen. So mm. I want to be known one day as part of an upscale couple. I don't think it'll ever happen. Who, who but shares, I, share a television television who shares a television set? <laughs> well, you have Callie and I you do. have Elvis. I'm an upscale thruple and we yeah. share. <laughs> you actually have multiple television sets, don't you? I only have one now, but the okay. one I have is truly glorious and enormous and is the longest and most successful relationship I've ever been in. (laughs) I love that we're calling it a television set. Set. (laughs) Yeah, set. What is that even television set? set. (laughs) Turn down the set. Turn down the set. (laughs) Me talking to Corey every time we record. (laughs) Oh, my God. Okay. Uh, and then in 1996, a kerfuffle transpired. I love a good kerfuffle. Mm. So TCI, one of the United States' largest subscription providers, so like Mediacom, I suppose. Mm-hmm. I have Mediacom, or I would, I guess, if I had cable. Anyway, announced that it would no longer carry lifetime in certain markets to make room for the soon-to-be-launched Fox News Channel. No, uh, worst down glow in history. I know. In which TCI held a financial stake. Weird. 
According yeah. to Lifetime executives, the network stood to lose up to 1 million subscribers due to TCI's move. However, oh, Lifetime published advertisements in some of the markets that would be affected, including Eugene, Oregon, and Newport, Rhode Island, informing customers that TCI was removing the only network that was made for women. After TCI customers called the company to complain, TCI cut back the number of homes that would lose lifetime to approximately 300,000. So they scaled it back pretty significantly, but still, still, still almost a third of what yeah. they, yeah, yeah. Uh, still, women's groups and politicians rallied behind Lifetime. Colorado Representative Patricia Schrader, or Schroeder, Schrodinger, called TCI's decision <laughs> a, quote, power play between TCI Chief Executive John Malone and Fox Executive Rupert, Rupert Murdoch. Rupert We're right back in succession, y'all. Yeah. We're seriously right are. back in it. Power I don't play. Like it. <laughs> Representative Shiv called TCI. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Stay out of the helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> I love that show so much. Then why oh the fuck God. are you on the phone? All right. <laughs> 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 it's so good. I have a new episode and to watch as soon as we're done here. They share our hatred of cruises. Oh, Y'all. Yeah. Everyone should share that hatred. Mm. Uh, okay. I don't know where I left off. Um, Rupert um, Murdoch. Um, yeah, it was mid-sentence. I got to start over. Colorado Representative Patricia Schrader called TCI's decision a power play between TCI Chief Executive John Malone and Fox Executive Rupert Murdoch and said also, quote, women kind of feel like they're being rolled over so that the guys who run these companies can make more money. It's the name Shocking. of the game. God. Mm. Massachusetts Congressman Barney Frank said that the decision showed that Fox, quote, might have an agenda of its own that is anti-woman. Hmm. Hmm. Yikes. Just going to leave. The, let that one simmer. Ugh. TCI executives were surprised and angry about the public's reaction. TCI's vice president of programming was quoted in the New York Times as saying, quote, I resent the implication that they are the women's network. Other networks come into us and say, Lifetime is not telling the truth. Lifetime is a women's channel only in name and advertising. It programs for ratings. Which, like, yeah. Doesn't every station do that? <laughs> yeah, the TV it's, network. How, how That's showbiz, else, baby. How else would it be a women's <laughs> channel other than its targeted demographic, its programming, and its advertising? Yeah. Yeah, not sure how else to do it. Oh, my okay. God. Okay. So TCI Senior <laughs> Vice President Robert Thompson stated that the reaction was, quote, laughably out of scale. Based, They're being hysterical. <laughs> uh, yeah. Based on the fact that less than 10% of Lifetime's audience would be affected. But 10% of a network's audience nothing? is a lot of fucking people and a lot of fucking sure. money. Yeah. TCI executives chalked the politician's reaction up to lobbying by Lifetime and it being an election year and suggested to the Times that in retaliation, Disney, which again is one of Lifetime's parent companies, may have trouble launching a new network on TCI. So they're like, mm, too bad you, Disney's Disney. embroiled in all of this. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. in 1997, by the way, it was reported that Lifetime had almost 68 million subscribers. Good. So I'm pretty sure that TCI went ahead and knocked Lifetime off of those 300,000 subscribers to make room for Fox News. Mm -hmm. Like, as far as I could tell, they didn't win that kerfuffle. Mm -hmm. So that's your daily reminder that Fox News is a fucking stain on modern society. Moving on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Cheers. Leave <laughs> Lifetime alone. Leave yeah. Lifetime alone. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, all right. So bringing this back around to a little more lighthearted, a little more lighthearted content. Here's a list of some of the most ridiculous Lifetime movie titles. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> Baby this for sale. This is what I'm here for. Okay. You have to drink every time you've seen one of these. If you've seen one of these. I don't remember what I've seen. So I'm just going to drink at every one of these. Mm, great. Mm. I love this plan. Drink at every one that the name makes you want to see it. Okay. okay. So every one of these. Perfect. All right. Baby for sale. 
Yep. Nick. Drink. <laughs> <laughs> yep. From straight A's to triple X. Oh, the Amanda I Jacobson story. The Vin Diesel story <laughs> is really not what you expect. <laughs> restless, yes. restless virgins. Oh, no. <laughs> Us in high school. Mm-hmm. <laughs> drink. There's so much dry humping in that movie. <laughs> drink, slay, love. <laughs> yes. I want that. Drink, slay, a weathered wooden sign. <laughs> uh, grumpy cat's worst Christmas ever. <laughs> oh, drinking. <laughs> a lot of these were like. One-off Christmas movies. I oh yeah, so they many. bring now, it for Christmas. Now the Hallmark Channel is getting in uh-huh. on that, and my cousin has been on a bunch of Hallmark Channel movies. The Hallmark Channel's been doing that the Christmas thing for a while. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of the only card they have, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they're playing it. <laughs> yeah, get it. All card. right, <laughs> next it. one. I love this one. Side order of life. <laughs> <laughs> What the fuck? I don't even know. (laughs) We need to write one. No, you know what I wish? Okay, if we had more time, I would want each of us to give what we think the synopsis is of each Mm -hmm. of these movies. We do not have have time. We don't have time, but the the titles are not giving any hints, really. (laughs) Maybe maybe for Patreon content. Oh, I love it. (laughs) Yeah, baby for sale was that one's a pretty obvious one. Kind of on the nose. But side <laughs> order of life? <laughs> Should I Google no it? No clue. No. <laughs> no, no okay. we don't have time. Moving on. There's no time. All right, moving on. My Little Assassin. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a children's book that I'm writing. <laughs> I, I really liked this one. Baby Monitor, colon, <laughs> Sound of Fear. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's my motherhood summed up. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. And now I'm going to read the tagline for Baby Monitor Sound of Fear because this is going to come <laughs> yes. back around in a few minutes. Oh, thank God. Tagline is, she was hired to watch the children. Now someone is watching her. Good God. Okay. Oh, so remember wow. that. Clearly okay. about a babysitter. All right. More funny names. The <laughs> last prostitute. Where? Ever? <laughs> yeah. The very <laughs> <Good> last <luck. laughs> one. Yeah, good, good luck. <laughs> uh, mother, oh, may I sleep with danger? I've seen that. I've that's seen that classic. one too. That's classic. That's a good one. That's Tori Spelling, right? It sure is. Yes. Some of her best work. Oh, this one's for you, Amanda. Danielle Steele's Daddy. Oh, yeah. This has actually been on my list forever. I've never actually seen it. Unclear if it's, it's about one. Danielle Steele's father. No, it's not. It's a. It's <laughs> based on a Danielle Steele novel called Daddy. Oh. There should be a colon there. There should but be. But it's not there. Well... Not Comma. necessarily a colon, but they could have figured out a better way to... The t- sure. full title is Danielle Steele's Daddy. That's all. It's misleading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Oh, this was my favorite one. It's called A Fair to Remember. Fair spelled F-A-R-E. A <laughs> what? Fair. Like Not- a bus fare. <laughs> it is about a woman who falls in love with her taxi driver. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, yes. I thought it was going to be like a carnival fair, but then it's, F-A-R-E. Uh, it's the lifetime <laughs> reimagining of Taxi Driver. No, no. <laughs> a a real fair reimagining. To no. Yes. Oh, no. Oh, I love this. Oh, my God. Okay, just a couple more. Abducted, a father's love. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. no. No, 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 the no. wrong signal. Yeah. Terrible. Daddy issues, party of everyone. <laughs> oh, no. God. <laughs> All right. Here's another good one. Crimes of passion, colon, she woke up pregnant. No. Why, why are some of them TMI in the title? I and some of them it. is no information in the title. She woke up pregnant. It's about a woman who was raped by her dentist while she was under anesthesia. Holy oh fucking my God. shit. Which yeah. has happened. Yeah. Based on oh, a true absolutely. Story. It's happened. 
Yeah. <gasps> a lot oh. of Lifetime movies are based on real, like, crimes. I should hope yeah, so, because that's the whole subject matter of this episode. <laughs> right. Well, no, I know, but, like, a lot. Uh, like, the what? majority, other than the really bonkers Christmas <laughs> ones, but, like, the majority of Lifetime movies. Okay, last funny title, My Stepson, My Lover. Nope. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's not on Lifetime. That's on Pornhub. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh. All right. And just to round... The Woody it, Allen story. Just to round this out, I also wanted to let you know some surprising stars who end up in Lifetime movies. Yes, yes, yes. So yes, here yes, are some yes, notable yes, yes. examples. Um, Kirsten Dunst was in 15 and Pregnant. Mm-hmm. Nice. Tori Spelling was in Death mm-hmm. of a Cheerleader. And there is a photo. I put photos of a lot of these on the drive. The cover images are ridiculous. They're amazing. Oh, my God. Okay, so this is the one that I wanted you to keep in mind. Um, So Carrie Russell is in a movie called The Babysitter's Seduction. Mm -hmm. So remember that tagline I read you earlier for Baby Monitor Sound of Fear? Yeah, 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 yeah. So Baby yeah. Monitor Sound of Fear was, she was hired to watch the children. Now someone is watching her. And then Carrie Russell in The Babysitter's Seduction, the tagline is, she was hired to watch over his kids, but who was going to watch over her? Why are oh they reusing the these? same thing. It's Ugh. basically the same, but with like a sexy added to the, ba- the Babysitter's Seduction. I think I've seen seen this one she has sex with the dad not like the children yeah yeah, 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 yeah. i've seen the babysitter's seduction yeah yeah Yeah, Yeah. i know i have but also it's just like the the confession that i did at the in the most recent gossip at the corpse cart about the woman who was like oh are you coming with me to you're coming with (laughs) me (laughs) me. that's my fave that poor sweet little old lady (laughs) it's the same thing (laughs) <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, also, bonus memory from when we all saw the babysitter's seduction. The dad who gets seduced is Reverend Camden from Seventh Heaven. Yeah, oh who God. turns out to be like a super problematic, like pedophile in yeah. real life. Shocking. Is he a pedophile? That dude is. Uh, I don't. There's yeah, something he had like, about him. Ooh. I can't remember. This came out there was a while some ago. Scandal. I'm going to Google it, but there was definitely a sex scandal, like a either some sort of sexual assault or something, and I feel like it was an underage person. Probably. I'm going to look this up while you keep going. Okay. A couple more. Sora Birch in The Pregnancy Pact, which I almost covered today, so I've seen like half of it. Amazing. Uh, Everyone's favorite housewife, Lisa Rinna, in Another Woman's Husband. Mm-hmm. Kristen Chenoweth in The Twelve Men of Christmas. <laughs> Be a man at Jacobson's story. Yeah, yeah. really. <laughs> oh, seventh Heaven dad Stephen Collins admits to abusing underage girls. Quote, I did something terribly wrong. Ish. In a 1,000 word statement, Collins admits to abusing three different girls on five separate occasions. Blah, blah, blah. Yahoo News, Katie Couric. So he's terrible. Yeah. Fucking canceled. Fully fucking canceled. Can't watch Seventh Heaven ever again. Ugh. I don't think anything even puts that in syndication because of that. That that broke like five or six years ago. Dang. Mm -hmm. No memory of that. All right. Couple more. Denise Richards was in I Do, But I Don't. (laughs) (laughs) That's the best one. That's the best one. I'm going to say that at my wedding. <laughs> Under do, your breath. But I, I do. Don't. But I don't. <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> the priest, the yeah, priest you cross is just like. cross your fingers behind <laughs> your bouquet, does it just not count? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and last but not least, and I had to read the um, caption for this from a complex article. Not like the article was complex, but it's from complex.com. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, so Melissa Joan Hart starred in Twisted Desire, and yes. here's 
And here's the description of Twisted Desire. Quote, forget everything you thought you knew about Clarissa Darling, a.k.a. <laughs> yes. Melissa Joan Hart. When she's not <laughs> explaining it all, the characteristically <laughs> nice Nickelodeon star is manipulating dudes into killing her parents. An uncharacteristically mm. sober Danny Baldwin and Isabella Hoffman. Or, no. well, one in particular. Little does her pawn, Nick, played by Jeremy Jordan, know that it's really all a plot to get them out of the way so she can go back to dating her football hero ex, Brad. Contain your excitement, <laughs> please. <laughs> Just start dating him again. You don't have Need to, to kill, kill your parents. Your parents. <laughs> also, I'm glad they addressed the pluralness of dudes killing her parents because I was yeah. going to ask how many dudes does it take to kill her parents? <laughs> I love it. If you okay. want something done right, do it your fucking self, Clarissa. Yeah, God. Explain that. Explain it all. Ugh. Anyway, well, that's my segment. I love it. Very nice. That was amazing. Such and a trip down memory I lane. I do, but I don't. I, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. All right. Should we hear a word from our sponsors? Yes. Yes. If you have been listening to this show, you have definitely heard us talk about Framebridge. They make it super easy and affordable to frame your favorite things from kids' art and concert posters to the vacation photos that are just sitting on your phone, practically useless. Here mm -hmm. is how it works. Just go to framebridge.com and upload your photo, or they will send you packaging to safely mail in your physical pieces. That's what I did personally. I love it. It's beautiful. It's so easy. You can preview your item online in any frame style, choose your favorite, or get free recommendations from their talented designers. Mm -hmm. And the expert team at Framebridge will custom frame your item and deliver your finished piece directly to your door, ready to hang. And these puppies are stunning. Y'all, mm -hmm. I have spent so much more at traditional frame stores and had those items like fall to pieces, but all of my frame bridge pieces look brand spanking new. I look so grown up, hashtag adulting with yes. all of my framed art on the walls. I am obsessed with frame bridge. Um, mm -hmm. And instead of the hundreds that you would pay at a framing store, their prices start at just $39 and all shipping is free. Plus, our listeners will get 15% off their first order at framebridge.com when they use our code GALS, G-A-L-S. So get started today. Go to framebridge.com and use promo code GALS and you'll save an additional 15% off your first order. Just go to framebridge.com, promo Promo code GALS. One more time. That's framebridge.com. Promo code GALS. Treat your walls. Treat them. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my bones. Except not because I'm a ghost. Um, yeah, if you couldn't tell, it's the most wonderful time of year. Uh, Halloween. Yes. And Remember when planning your costume as a kid was like the most fun you could have pre-holidays? Uh, yes. Um, now that you're an adult, Halloween feels maybe a little less Halloween-y. Am I right? Mm -hmm. well, a little bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. A little bit, but we can remedy that situation because Me Undies is bringing back the childlike joy of picking out the perfect costume with their spooky prints <laughs> and Ooh, Halloween spooky. costume onesies. Uh. That is right. Costumes, onesies, boo. It's uh. amazing. I love Me Undies so much. This this underwear is a spooky soft. I'm quite literally wearing my Halloween jack-o'-lantern me undies right now. <laughs> it is like cradling my derriere on a soft cloud, a soft, malleable cloud. Mm -hmm. These are designed to be the best thing you've ever put on your body level soft. Like softer than a fluffy kitten dressed up in a pumpkin costume. Aww. Right? Softer than the brains that zombies love to eat. Oh, too far. <laughs> well, it's a true crime podcast, so deal with it. <laughs> These are the softest undies known to man, and they're also available in sizes extra small to 4XL, so they are soft for all. And one of my mm -hmm. favorite things about the MeUndies website 
is you can get matching undies with your partner and don't think that I have not mm-hmm. filled my cart with matching she undies has. for me and my partner. Mm-hmm. I love them so much. Worst case, it's just twice the undies for you, really. Precisely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, the patterns, y'all. Me Undies has the most unique prints out there, but the Halloween prints are on another level of spooky. This year, Me Undies is coming out with a variety of festive prints to really put the boo in booty. Yes. <laughs> I love it. And didn't think undies would up your Halloween costume game? Well, think again, because you're wrong. Their unique prints are designed to be mixed and matched and turned into the most guaranteed first prize at the costume contest costume. And if you don't feel like leaving your house, hello, you are Ever. singing my song. That's cool, mm-hmm. too. Just wear the Halloween costume onesies to pass out candy and you're good to go. I literally have one and it is so soft and so comfy. It's and so I will cute. be wearing it for the week of Halloween or maybe like the mm-hmm. month and of the Halloween. And the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, starting now. It's kind of like my Christmas costume, too, if I'm being honest. Um, yeah. So, Me Undies has a great offer for our listeners. For any first time purchasers, and also those first time purchases, you're in for a treat. You get 15% off and free shipping. This is a no brainer, especially because they have a 100% satisfaction guarantee. So, to get your 15% off your first pair, free shipping, and a 100% satisfaction guarantee, go to meundies.com slash gals. Again, that is meundies.com slash gals, G-A-L-S. Treat your bum. Treat, Treat it. it. So Carlina Renee White was born on July 15th, 1987. Good vintage. Prove it. Yes. <laughs> Prove it. <laughs> well, Show us your birth certificate. Well. Brock. Will, that will be a problem. No. Oh it will be difficult. It'll <laughs> we'll get to it. <laughs> we'll get to it. So she was born in Harlem, New York to 16-year-old Joy White and 22-year-old Carl Tyson. Joy and Carl were childhood friends turned sweethearts. Carl worked as a truck driver and in a parking garage, and Joy was still in high school when she quote fell pregnant <laughs> with It's pronounced Coral. <laughs> with baby <laughs> Coralina. Um, yes. Coral Ray Jepsen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> After she was born, uh, Joy, the mom, started uh, continued living at her own mother's house. But Carl, the dad, would stop by every evening to spend time with his daughter. Uh, But then when Carlina was only 19 days old, she developed a 103, 104 degree fever. Oh, no. And her parents took her to the Harlem Hospital Center. Joy and Carl were understandably, understandably distraught that their little baby was unwell. And they remember a kind nurse sitting with them and assuring them that everything would be fine. But like a baby's fever that high is very serious. That's scary shit. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But that night, their fears about their daughter's health were replaced by an entirely new horror. Oh, Ooh. God. Baby Carlina had disappeared from the hospital sometime around 3 a.m. No. Oh my God. She had been receiving intravenous antibiotics, but had not yet been diagnosed. When a nurse went to check on her, she found a disconnected IV line and no baby. No, baby. No. <laughs> no, <laughs> baby. No. <laughs> no trace of evidence. <laughs> um. Hospital policy was for the baby to be checked every five minutes by a staff member. Mm -hmm. Um, And this was being followed, or at least they think it was being followed, uh, which means the kidnapper must have been closely observing that pattern and snatched Carlina in one of those Mm five-minute intervals. Or was working at the hospital. Or was Hillary Clinton. Oh, but her emails. <laughs> but ran a pizza shop, maybe. I have no idea. Covering up some was. sort of baby sex ring. <laughs> okay. God. So, 
<laughs> um, fortunately, this case is not about a baby sex ring. I will tell you Thank that. Thank God. Okay. So, um, but I just thought that was crazy that somebody came in during one of those five minute intervals. Tiny yeah. window. I, they have to be, yeah, no, nope, I got theories. Let's keep going. So it soon became clear that the kindly nurse who had comforted Joy and Carl mm-hmm. did, n- did not match the description of anyone on the hospital <gasps> staff. Oh, oh, it's so creepy. I hate it. I love it. I hate it. A heavy set black woman between the ages of 25 and 30 who had, quote, some hair under her chin. Okay, but we all do. Oh, my God. We're mammals. Yeah. Yes. But also, we can use tools like tweezers. So, um, <sighs> she did how... Don't chin hair shame anybody. I feel personally I... attacked. <laughs> I do feel personally attacked. <laughs> I have plenty of chin hair, and it's wiry as fuck. I just take care of it. <laughs> okay. Kenyon so bends did... to societal gender norms. Yeah. I do. I do. In a lot of respects. I don't give a shit about shaving my puss or my legs, but... <laughs> but my beard. Yes. <laughs> yes. But my beard and pits. I I'm shave both up my upstairs and beard and my downstairs. downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. She did, however, match the description of a woman the other nurses had noticed hanging around the hospital for the past few weeks. No. Don't Apparently... Just, uh, yeah, apparently several people had separately questioned her presence and she had claimed to be visiting a relative on a different floor. So uh-huh. like she was raising red flags but nobody like did anything about it. I mean, that is a little weird. Like it, security at hospitals is very odd. I I had a friend in the hospital recently and I spent a considerable amount of time there for the couple days that they were there. And like walked right by nurses' desks at whatever hour, wasn't questioned. The only place where there was even, like, a locked door to let you in and out was in the ER. But once they were on a floor, as long as I, like, no one even asked me who I was, what what room I was going to, I didn't have to have a visitor's tag, like, nothing. I know, it's a little odd, and, like, I don't, I wouldn't want to, like, because obviously also, like, she this person is a person of color and you don't want to get in a situation where you're like harassing people or like being suspicious. No, but even like a sign-in sheet. Not even that for like visitors hours. Like it's, there's just nothing. Yeah, I agree. That's been my experience. It's a little weird. There should be some sort of tracking. Yeah, Yeah. I agree. It's weird. Um, Although the hospital did have video surveillance, it was classic, not working that night. Mm. So there was no way to confirm that this was indeed the person who had taken the baby. Everyone just assumed it was because she pretended to be a nurse and had been lurking around for several weeks and then was Which never seen again. Is a little a little sketchy. That's yeah. kind of telling. <laughs> Feel like it's a safe assumption from all <laughs> yeah. of that. It's circumstantial. It wouldn't hold up in court. Right. <laughs> A guard, however, did remember seeing a woman who matched the description leaving the hospital around 3.30 a.m. He said that she did not have a baby with her, but thinking back on it, the guard thought that the baby could have been concealed under her nurse's smock. Mm. Like it was possible, but again, not like smuggling proof. a ham. Carlina's case was widely publicized as it was the first known case of an infant being abducted from a hospital in New York City. So it was in all of the like New York tabloid papers and and regular newspapers. Like it's a horrific thing. Kind of shocking right. that that's the first time. First known case. Yeah, 1987. Yeah, still. Um The city offered a $10,000 reward for the safe return of Carlina and missing persons flyers with her photograph were distributed nationwide, but there was no sign of her anywhere. And there are photos on the drive, but there are like a lot of photos on the drive. So let me, do you see like the really cute baby, like the super round headed baby photos? Yeah, honey. 
I know. She was oh, so muffin. Oh, my God. Baby she was such muffin. a pudge. She I does guess. have a super round head. Oh, my God. It's like a cue ball. I no, love her. I know, She's I know. so cute. I yeah. love her so much. I know. Amanda took know. her. Oh. <laughs> Amanda, check her nurse's smock. I'm so sorry. <laughs> my figs. My figs. It's <laughs> the real reason she loves her figs. I really love my figs because they conceal a human infant child so well with those versatile utilitarian pockets. Those deep pockets. Oh my God. We're going to get dropped. Okay. 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 So back to this horrific story. So, um, flyers are distributed everywhere nationwide, but there's no sign of baby Carlina. Oh. Her parents uh, separated the year after she went missing. They were both really young. Also, that's like a very traumatic thing to go through. Yeah. Um, they And people split up. Um, they sued the hospital for $100 million and received wow. a settlement of $750,000 in right, 1993. So way less than $100 million. So a pittance, basically. <laughs> um for having their baby taken. Yeah. Um, they continued to grieve and to hope that Carlina might be out there somewhere, but the shocking story of the infant stolen from the hospital faded from public memory, and the chance of ever ever finding her seemed more and more remote as the years passed. So there's just, like, no further leads, no further information, nothing. This is so fucking typical, too, for cases of missing... People of Children color. of color. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, okay. Meanwhile, 45 miles from Harlem in Bridgeport, Connecticut, a young girl named Nadra Nance, who was nicknamed Nettie, lived with her mother, Anugeta Petway. Uh, Anugeta went by Anne. So daughter's name is Nettie. Mom's name is Anne. Got it. The girl's father, Robert, was a drug addict who would show up and stay with them for brief periods throughout her childhood, but he wasn't, like, super in her life. Sure. Uh, When Nettie was 10, Anne had another baby, a boy named Trayvon. Nettie remembers her childhood as not great, but not terrible either. Um, So her mother went through periods of abusing drugs and would sometimes hit the kids, but... Mm. Nettie also remembers being well provided for, like there was, you know, food in the cupboards and the fridge and like, you know, she had a backpack and she went to school and all the like normal shit, right? Sure. Um, But she also was occasionally being hit by her mother, but she considered the beatings that she endured as like par for the course where she grew up. So like how I interpret that is, in the time and place, it was a lot more commonplace for the type of physical discipline that was going on. And yeah, kind of sh- like spanking and yeah. shit like that. It was just a it regular sounded, punishment. It sounded like it was maybe a step up from like spanking. Like it was sure, maybe like but some, like that's how they kind of frame it. Right. The way she sees her own experience is that it was pretty par for the course and like her friend's lives were the same. It was a whooping. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, she reflects, so this is Nettie again. She reflects, quote, I'm not going to say she was the best mom ever, but she did what she had to do to make me who I am. She was strict, but she was cool. All my friends used to say that she was a cool mom. Okay. And Did she as have a gen- beard? <laughs> well, she's not the prettiest lady, I will say that. The I have a feeling Anne. we'll get to it. Okay. Yeah. Anne worked as a janitor to support Nettie and Trayvon, and she sent Nettie to live with her grandmother during the week so that she could attend an elementary school in a nicer part of town. Mm -hmm. So she, like, cared about her kids' education. Um, Nettie's elementary school principal remembers her as an outgoing and, quote, vivacious child. She dreamed of someday becoming a famous dancer, rapper, or model. She was into entertaining and, you know, 
uh, the arts. Um, throughout Nettie's childhood, however, her aunts and cousins, who she spent a lot of time with, uh, especially when she was living at her grandmother's, she was close, like very close to her extended family, would speculate behind her back about her lack of resemblance to Anne. Oh, dear. Knew it. So, Anne had dark skin, and Nettie's complexion was much lighter. And really, in fact, they didn't share any sim- similar physical features at all, which, like, is a fucking blessing for Nettie, let me tell you. <laughs> oh, uh, brutal. God. <laughs> <laughs> well, can look on the drive at some of these photos. I'm not going to pass judgment on this woman's appearance at this moment. Well, she's a psychopath, so I don't mind. Um, Who stole a baby from a hospital. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Clearly. Nettie is beautiful. Nettie is stunningly beautiful. Okay. Uh, Before long, Nettie picked up on this speculation and began to question the lack of resemblance herself. She would often stare at photos of her and her mother trying to find anything that they had in common physically. Ooh, that's sad. I didn't read anywhere about what she if she thought she looked like Robert, um, but it doesn't sound like she picked up much of a resemblance there either. It sounds like to anyone in the family, which is like the whole family was gossiping about this. That's what started this whole yes. inquiry. Exactly. So when Nettie was a senior in high school, she became pregnant. She was excited about the pregnancy. So her cousin, Brittany, who she was really close friends with, was pregnant too at the same time. Pregnancy packed. Yes. Lifetime movie. Is that the movie? Back. No, uh, but no. there is a movie called The Pregnancy Pact, which you mentioned, yeah. which I almost Thora covered. Birch. And then the it's case amazing. that I did cover had a pregnancy, not a pact, but just two people pregnant at the same time. <laughs> um, so the two of them were looking forward to becoming mothers together. So she was, she was excited about becoming a mom. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in order to receive free prenatal care from the state, she needed to provide her own birth certificate. Oh, here we go. Here we go. It's about to (laughs) unravel. (laughs) In order to move to South Africa in her (laughs) late 20s, she needed to provide her birth certificate. Um, Okay. When she asked her mother where it was and brushed her off and said she would, quote, deal with it later. Uh Uh-huh. Impatient, Nettie waited until her mother was out of the house and searched through her papers. She found a document with her name and birth date on it and brought it to the New Haven Bureau of Vital Statistics, but the clerk could find no record of Nettie in the system. Oh, my word. Can you imagine the montage that had to have taken place in this film while she was rifling through all these papers? I can see it so clearly clearly in my mind. I know. Uh, The clerk also made clear to her that the document that she had found was not legal proof of identity and not a birth certificate. So he was like, okay, like, but this isn't good enough. Um, When Nettie confronted her mother back home, Anne broke down crying and told Nettie that she had something to confess. Oh, God. Through tears, she told Nettie that she was not her real mother. Her birth mother, she said, had been a drug addict who had left her with Anne as a newborn and never returned. Oh, my God. Lies. So just compound the trauma. Yeah. Uh, Anne refused to provide more information or to answer Nettie's questions about the woman's name or whether she had been a stranger or an acquaintance of Anne's, like... Like, what do you mean someone left me with you? Like, did you know them? You like, just, right. yeah, all the questions you wouldn't think of, she just wouldn't exactly. answer any of them. The two eventually stopped discussing it, but the relationship between them became more and more distant as Nettie's suspicions grew. She began talking to other family members, trying to find out more about the circumstances surrounding her appearance in Anne's life. Everyone in her family remembered Anne announcing she was pregnant in 1987. Okay. But upon further questioning, none of them were actually present at the birth. Uh, So Nettie didn't really know what to make of this information. Like, you said that someone gave me to you, but then you told the family you were pregnant. 
Like, yeah, it's weird. Were you were you really pregnant? Had you did she miscarry and then coincidentally was given an unwanted baby? Sure. <laughs> Had she faked a pregnancy to explain away a baby baby that she'd already been given? Like, what was the deal? Right. Nettie then questioned her quote father Robert, who was now in jail on a rape charge. Oh God. Oh. And he, t- yeah, he told her that he and Anne had only been together on and off in 1987 and that he had never known for sure if Nettie was his. Okay, so no help there. Yeah. Because he wasn't even around enough to, like, say, yes, I saw her pregnant, yes, like, right. yada, yada, yada. Yeah, just inconclusive. Sure. Um. So after Nettie gave birth to her own daughter, Samani which is such a pretty name. Yeah. Uh, in 2005, she continued distancing herself from Anne. She Can't got blame her, her for that. Right. She was just like, something is fucking weird and like, you're not answering my questions and like, yeah. She got her high school diploma. She began working as a motel clerk and she saved up enough money to move into her own place with Samani. A couple years later, she moved from Bridgeport, Connecticut to Atlanta to live near to an aunt that she was really close with. And she eventually confessed to her aunt everything she had learned about Anne. And her aunt urged her to continue investigating and to find her real birth mother. And this is the trailer for the Lifetime movie is this scene of her and the aunt and figuring it out. And it's phenomenal. (laughs) Um. So Nettie spent her days working in a hair salon and her nights on the internet combing through stories of children who had gone missing in Connecticut around 1987. Um, But nothing seemed to fit. And then one night in December of 2010, when Nettie was 23 years old, she had like a eureka moment and she realized that she could have gone missing from anywhere, not just Connecticut. True. True. And could have, you know, been missing from somewhere else and then brought to Connecticut, especially because it's Connecticut is surrounded by so many yeah. other states. Yeah. So she went to the website for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Yes, 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 yes. Ever heard of it? Uh, <laughs> where she found a picture of a baby girl who had gone missing from a hospital in Harlem when she was just 19 days old and had a Perfect little cue ball head. Yes. <laughs> so the baby, she thought, looked strikingly like her own daughter, Samani. So she wasn't mm. comparing her own baby photos to this baby photo. She was comparing her daughter's baby photos to. Makes sense. Yeah. A few days later, she worked up the courage to call the hotline number that was listed on the website. And she told the person who answered, I feel like I don't know who I am. Oh, poor baby. She was too nervous to share her suspicions about the photo she'd found, but admitted that she suspected that she'd been abducted, and she also described a distinctive birthmark on her arm. Again, this is all part of the scene. It's so good. Um, The center was able to cross-reference this detail along with the timing of Nettie's appearance in Anne's life with their database, turning up a match with Carlina White. Oh! Even before the DNA results had come back, and also I, my subheading for this section is, I just took a DNA test, turns out. Oh, my God. I'm Carlina White. <laughs> You're? I'm 100% Carlina White. <laughs> Even though somebody. I got stolen. Yeah, I got mommy problems. That's a baby in me. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. Grow up. Now I saw them. That's a goddess in me. <laughs> Could have had your own kid. Let's do it little. I don't know. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> I can't even. How do you do that? How do you I don't make know. up I don't perfect, perfect? I don't know. It just, it, I don't know. It's, it's a, gift. a gift. It just comes to me. <laughs> it's a gift. You could have had your own kids. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> Even before oh. the DNA results had come back, Nettie had such a strong feeling that she was Carlina that she reached out to Joy and Carl on her own 
and began regularly speaking with them on the phone, which like. Wow, that's brave. Mabes wouldn't recommend because like yeah, what if she until you wasn't? Get the proof and then yeah. you. Yeah, because if you're not and then you've just destroyed their hopes these, this and strangers that you don't even know and your own hopes yeah yeah, yeah. I, i'm here for the reconnection but like get the results yeah yeah exactly um so carl remembers quote we're talking and all of a sudden she's calling me dad and i'm sitting here saying to myself i can't believe it this is my daughter that's my firstborn Oof. and joy would be trying to call too and so she would say dad mom's on the phone and i was like this girl is calling us mom and dad he's like so excited hmm. um in january she traveled to new york to meet them the visit had its ups and downs. So Nettie felt immediately connected to Joy and to the aunts and cousins that she met. Um, didn't feel super bonded with Carl. Um, also, she was really homesick for Atlanta. and mm-hmm. Well, like, ex- and she kind of had her own dad issues given her upbringing. Her dad. Yeah. Ex- oh, yeah so that's going to cause some, you know, walls to be up um, anyway. Absolutely. Um, She's also like homesick. She's exhausted. Like the emotional toll of all of this Mm, is really intense. mm -hmm. And like Joy and Carl are super relieved and happy. Um, But they're also like all up in her business and they're all essentially strangers to her still at this point. So it's just like a lot to process, obviously. Yeah, that would be really hard. Um, so at the airport, as she was leaving New York, she got the phone call from uh, a New York City police detective who told her that the DNA was a match and wow. she was Carlina White. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. That's so spooky. I can't even imagine. I, can you imagine being an adult with your own child and then discovering you are not who you thought you were for your entire life? I mean... I, uh, yeah, that's unbelievable. It's a lot. Talk and that space. your mom is a crazy Seriously. person. The woman yeah. who raised you is a full-on psychopath. A cuckoo bananas baby stealer. Yeah. That's the craziest part. It's so scary. All right, so the 23 years between when Carlina disappeared and when she solved her own case. Yas, Quinn is the longest known gap between a victim being abducted by a non-family member and then successfully reunited with their family. Yeah, because usually they're dead. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. It's really sad, but that's the truth. Yeah. I mean, statistically, yes. Yeah. Um... So Anne Petway was arrested by the FBI. Uh, She pled guilty to the federal kidnapping charges. There weren't state charges because of a fucking statute of limitations. Fuck that. That should apply in this situation. I know. That should be lifted for these kinds of circumstances. I don't know why we have it, period. It shouldn't exist. Who does it should. Yeah, fuck you. I don't care if you're 90 or you're 19. You got to do your time. Oh, so uh, the federal kidnapping charges did not have a statute of limitations, so that's what she was charged under. And because she pled guilty and reached a plea deal, she was sentenced to just 12 years in prison. No. Mm -hmm. She was only 50 when she went in, so she will very likely have quite a full life after getting out of prison. Fuck that shit. Um, during the sentencing hearing, her lawyers argued for leniency, claiming that Anne had, quote, provided a good home, minus all the drugs and the rapist partner, um, and that the abduction was, quote, motivated not by greed or desire to do harm, but by a desperate desire for a child combined with depression and grief over her failed pregnancies and significant mental illness, which, like, sure... Yeah, I don't doubt it, but then you need to get professional help. Right. Anyone everyone needs professional help, especially if you're dealing with like repeat traumas of very real and very serious repeat traumas of miscarriages or failed pregnancies. Like, 
And this is just another one of those situations where like mental health is stigmatized. Like that's not what caused you to steal a baby. Right. And it's, it's defense quote unquote, like loose defenses like that, that, that give folks un, unnecessary fear of people who struggle through trauma or with mental health issues. Right. Mo- the majority of these people do not go out and steal a baby or go out and kill somebody or whatever. It's usually self-harm that happens as a result of that. Right. So this is something on a whole other fucking level. You staked out a hospital for weeks. Weeks. Looking yeah. for opportunity to steal an infant child from a family. Yeah. You were uh, I mean, like a Roman myth about yeah. it. Depression doesn't make you fucking do that. I'm sorry, yeah. it just doesn't. Joy and Carl both spoke at the hearing to ask for a longer sentence. Carl said, for 23 years, Anne, you had me suffering. What you should get is 23 years, what you took away from me. But Fair enough. The victim impact statements did not change the sentencing. Of course not. Do they uh, ever? Ne- <laughs> yeah. Um, Nettie's relationship with Carl and Joy, her birth parents, uh, remained complicated. Sure. So Nettie struggled with anxiety due to the really intense media attention on her story. It was in, mm-hmm. like, all of the papers. Um, it was on, like, the Today Show and, like, Good Morning America and everything. Dr. Ruth. Yeah. Um, there were reports in the media that there was a falling out over money. So <clears throat> some of the settlement money from the hospital, the $750,000, had been put into a trust fund in baby Carlina's name. Okay. But then a couple things about that. The trust fund was only valid. uh, It was like a child trust fund. So it was like only valid up until the person was 21. Interesting. Okay. And then if, if it wasn't claimed before the person was 21, then it was liquidated back out to the trustees, I guess. All right. And and then another thing about it was like she was missing for 23 years. They had no hope of they really had lost hope of finding her. Right. Um so the trust fund was liquidated and spent by Joy and Carl, which I don't blame them for. No. No. 23 um, years. Yeah, no. Yeah. Go on vacation. Right. Like pay off some debts. You deserve it. God, yeah. It was it was a sweet and noble idea to create one in the first place. And then when you don't find your child for that long. Yeah. Um, Nettie resented these reports and described the rift not as due to financial anything, um, but as due to Joy and Carl's eagerness to appear in the media on like Oprah and stuff. And she was like, yeah, just not wanting that. She wants to go back to a normal it. life. Yeah, and she has her own daughter to raise, and, like, That's yeah. super fair. Yeah. Um, she acknowledged that for them, this was an entirely happy ending to the story, whereas for her, it, it was very bittersweet because she was struggling mm-hmm. with the fact that the relatives that she had grown up close to her whole life were not her, quote, real family, her words, yeah. not mine, but not her biological family. And not just Anne, but, like, all of her aunts and uncles and cousins. The people that, and her grandmother who, like, half raised her. Like, the people right. she was really close to. Right. And then she also had really complicated feelings about Anne and worry yeah. for her brother Trayvon, who was only 14 when Anne was arrested. So then Trayvon oh, had, had to, I, I think he was raised by a grandmother. He could have been raised by an aunt. I'm not sure. sure. After Anne went to prison. I hope he didn't get put into, like, the system, because that would be an no. additional tragedy. He for sure was raised by a relative. I just don't know which relative. Within a year of reuniting with her birth parents, Nettie cut off contact with them, because it just was, it was too, too much. much. In a 2011 interview, when asked about her name, she said, I say Nettie. I don't yeah. tell them my name is Nadra. Um, I don't tell them Carlina. Nettie is not what the Petway family gave me or what the White family gave me. It's what I gave myself. I like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ugh. 
Nettie sold the rights to her story to Lifetime and um, abducted the Carlina White story starring Kiki Palmer. Ooh. Yes. Aired in October 2012. Wow. Different from Abducted a Father's Love. Different. They yeah. super recycle their titles around there. There must be. I would love a full count of how many Lifetime movies start with abducted, colon. Right. <laughs> yeah, there must be a file somewhere on some computer. Abducted, colon, just like streaming down. She was hired right. to watch the children. <laughs> but who's watching her? <laughs> um... Last bit. After the media attention on the case died down, Nettie actually reestablished contact with her birth parents, and the three began working on slowly rebuilding their relationship. Oh, good for her. Yeah. So that is my case, the Carlina wow. White story. What a, what a tale you, you've taken on. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> nice job. Ugh, so yeah. proud. We'd be lost without you. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Let's hear a word from our sponsor. I'm going to steal another glass of wine real quick. (laughs) Oh, God. Causebox is a quarterly subscription box with amazing curated items that have meaning and that give back. It's gorgeous. I was so thrilled to get my cause box a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. It made my entire day. And every fall box has over $300 worth of items for just $50 per box. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this bad boy arrives seasonally, quarterly, four times a year, full of magic. Let me talk to you about the couple things that came in my fall box Mm -hmm. from cause box. Two of the things that I want to highlight. One the duffel bag. Oh, mm-hmm. This duffel bag is perfect for a weekend getaway. I literally couldn't believe that it even fit inside the box that was delivered along with all of the other amazing things that were in there. And the bag on its own normally costs over $100. It's super cute, super stylish, super sturdy, and absolutely perfect for a weekend getaway. I also love a necklace that came in here by Nashelle. And what's really amazing about it is that for every necklace that it sells, the company gives back 10 meals to those in need. So that's pretty awesome. Wild. I just I just love the whole concept behind, behind Cosbox. It's great. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's not just the bag and the necklace. There's like, I love every single item that came in this box. Mm-hmm. Also, you guys know that I am like skincare obsessed. And uh, it came with a Mela and Getz like face recovery oil that it's is so good. perfection and amazing. It's and magic. Really upping Mm -hmm. My glow game. I'm a big, big fan. Um, Mm -hmm. Also, one of the best parts of Causebox is that uh, our listeners will get 30% off their first box by using our promo code GALS30, G-A-L-S-3-0 at checkout. And 10% of the proceeds using our promo code GALS30 will go to the charity that we selected, which is the ACLU. Get it. So the American Civil Liberties Union, for almost 100 years, the ACLU has worked to defend and preserve the individual rights and liberties guaranteed by the Constitution and laws of the United States from defending human rights, including LGBTQ, immigrants, disability, and women's rights to criminal law reform, reproductive freedom, and free Mm -hmm. speech, the ACLU is there to protect you. And when you order this box full of adorable, great items, you can also automatically give back to the ACLU. It's amazing. Check out Causebox, promo code GALS30. Treat your life. Treat it. With HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit, you can get easy seasonal recipes and pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door. And all you have to do is cook and enjoy because HelloFresh makes cooking delicious meals at home a reality regardless of your comfort in the kitchen mine is close to zero uh HelloFresh can really help you say goodbye to endless grocery store trips my nightmare um and also take out food my ultimate weakness because HelloFresh has you covered I love HelloFresh. It's not always easy to cook from scratch, and HelloFresh just makes it 
the easiest and they have photos with their instructions, which for people like me is very helpful. Also wine pairings. So people like for us real. really appreciate it. So mm -hmm. you can break out of your dinner rut with HelloFresh's 20 plus seasonal chef curated recipes each week. I just got my box in the mail and I am so, so pumped to make the one pot beef and black bean chili. And that comes yum. with a yeah, with a spicy crema and Monterey Jack cheese. So it's like that time of year, all you want to eat is chili in your onesie mm -hmm. under a quilt, watching 90 Day Fiance, and Hello Fresh. Oh my gosh, yes! And Hello Fresh makes that a reality. It's also Heaven. super flexible and fits your lifestyle. You can add extra meals to your weekly order as well as yummy add-ons like garlic bread, yes please, and cookie dough, yes. Please. Could not ask for more from HelloFresh. Yeah. I'm here for I it. Mean, you could ask for more because we have an amazing offer for you. For $80 off your first month of HelloFresh, you can go to HelloFresh.com forward slash gals80 and enter gals80. Again, that's for $80 off your first month of HelloFresh. Go to HelloFresh.com forward slash gals80 and enter the code gals80. 80. You can get that 80 bucks off. That's like getting eight meals for free or like $20 off your first four boxes. Use that promo code GALS80, G-A-L-S-8-0 at HelloFresh.com and treat your gut. Treat it. Isn't it fun to like raise your arm and sniff your pits and they like smell really good? <laughs> yes, it is fun. <laughs> I'm having so much fun in that capacity with my new native deodorant. I have like mm -hmm. the citrus musk one and I, mm. I can't get enough of it. I love mm -hmm. my native deodorant. Native is formulated without aluminum, parabens and talc. Uh, it's also mm -hmm. filled with ingredients found in nature, such as coconut oil, which is antimicrobial, shea butter for that moisturizer and emollient, and tapioca mm -hmm. starch, which is, absorbs wetness. So very natural, mm -hmm. very oh. close to the earth. It's very effective. They do not test on animals. Love it. And they offer free shipping and returns. Mm -hmm. And if you're not already sold from all of these amazing benefits, also... It works. Making the switch to a natural deodorant does not mean having to sacrifice on odor and wetness protection. I use the cucumber mint one mm. because I'm in love with that scent. Mm -hmm. And I totally had my reservations because I used to use like some very not natural deodorant and I'm a sweaty Betty. Mm -hmm. And my transition into natural deodorant was actually very seamless I'm not sweating like I thought I would be. I am getting that odor protection that I was getting from a previous deodorant, but with like natural ingredients. And it smells even better than any other deodorant that I have ever used. And if you don't believe me, believe them because Native has over 8,000 five star reviews. You can check them out on the Today Show, Elle Magazine, Pop Sugar, Refinery29. I mean, these publications are raving about them. And again, the ingredients that you know, less is more with Native. They have fewer, simpler ingredients, so you know everything that's in their deodorant. I didn't realize how bad talc is. Like, it's scary some of the stuff about talc that you're reading, and I'm mm -hmm. much happier with the tapioca starch mm -hmm. option. Mm -hmm. It's a lot less terrifying. And it's worth it because aluminum may be linked to some serious health ramifications, and Native is aluminum-free, safe, and affected. And they have a little something for everyone. So Native comes in a wide variety of enticing scents for everybody. Plus, they release new limited edition seasonal scents, love a seasonal scent, throughout the year. They also offer an unscented formula and a baking soda-free formula for those with sensitivities. Again, something for everybody. Mm -hmm. I'm using that cucumber in mint. I really want to try the eucalyptus in mint. Mm -hmm. and, I have it. I love it. Ugh. And their most popular one is the coconut and vanilla. So I'm going to like maybe rotate some of my scents and, and mm -hmm. step out of my scent comfort they smell zone. so good. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's no risk to try because Native offers free returns and exchanges in the USA. 
So for 20% off your first purchase, visit nativedeodorant.com and use the promo code GALS20, that's G-A-L-S-20, during checkout. Again, you can get 20% off your first purchase by visiting nativedeodorant.com and using that promo code GALS20 during checkout. Treat your pits. Mm, Treat it. Okay. So first I want to say to Carol Joe of last week's Honeymoon Crimes episode. Honeymoon Homicides. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Honeymoon Homicides. She had selected a case for me to cover and I just got my wires crossed and covered the wrong case. But it also has a Lifetime movie made out of it. So <gasps> nice save. Yeah. <laughs> Redemption. So Carol Joe Colin. Here it the Amanda is. Amanda Jacobson story. Redemption. <laughs> Abducted Redemption. The Amanda Jacobson story. <laughs> also known as One Man's Trash. Anyway. <laughs> baby monitor. Um, <laughs> baby monitor. <laughs> So when Christina May, a.k.a. Tina, was just a wee babe, she made the trip from West Germany to Helena, Alabama. Sorry, Tina. uh, Where she was adopted by the loving Tommy and Cindy Thomas. Yes. Tommy Tommy Thomas. Thomas. No. (laughs) I can't even. They're so sweet. Tommy Thomas. Oh. Oh. Not much is known about her childhood, but she and her little sister, whose name I could not find, lived with their parents in Helena for years before moving to Louisiana. Um, Tina was a model student. She was involved in extracurricular activities, had like a very normal, you know, middle American upbringing, likes mm-hmm. football, all that kind of shit. That people Another in great love. lifetime montage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Middle America mm-hmm. shit. I know. Right? Amanda <laughs> Jacobson story. <laughs> <laughs> When Tina graduated high school, she was accepted into University of Alabama at Birmingham, where she met the love of her life, Roll tide. David Rolltide. Oh, oh man. Miss <laughs> Alabama. Um, David Gabriel Watson, who went by Gabe. Love. They met it, I know, ew. They met and began their romance in 2001 and fell madly in love. They really didn't waste any time. By 2003, the couple were wed. Mm -hmm. Uh, They took their honeymoon in Queensland, Australia, going on what would be my absolute fucking nightmare, a seven-day scuba diving expedition. No. Oh. No. Or no. Oh, no. That's like taking a cruise where you're never on the boat. Were they in the water for seven days? (laughs) No, no. (laughs) Circled by sharks. I They made a movie out of it, actually. I'd get chilly. I mean... (laughs) They were exploring the SS Yungala shipwreck site, which admittedly looks fucking rad. I popped a couple photos of it on the drive. Great. So, like, get um, super high and watch yeah. a fucking documentary about it right? in the comfort so you can, of your bedroom. Yeah. You can see some of these photos on the blog. Like, it's ex- the shipwreck is extremely beautiful, and it's, like, right off the Great Barrier Reef. Which is amazing, but also when I image searched it, far too many hits for quote sea snakes <laughs> popped up. So no, thank yeah. you. I also included a photo of a sea snake yes. on the drive. No, thank you, <laughs> Australia. Too big. It is literally a snake, which is a big ass fin on the tip of its tail. So you know <laughs> she fast. Oh, she's cute. Oh. She fast. I like it. Oh, no. I like a photo of it. I do not want to encounter that while like several <laughs> meters under the ocean sea yeah. line. It's like an eel no, meets a boa constrictor meets yeah. a fish. It's a cuter eel basically, but ugh. yeah. But. Anyway, so this this shipwreck site is uh, in particular is very popular to dive, but is considered to be a difficult dive and should be taken on by more experienced divers or with like one on one expert diving instructors. So did she so, grew up in Alabama and Germany? Mm-hmm. So does she have any diving experience? We'll get to it in the next sentence. <laughs> Great. Mm-hmm. Gabe had a fair amount of open ocean diving experience and some rescue dive training, but Tina did not. She had gotten her scuba certification, but had never gone deeper than nine meters. And given this information, the dive company strongly recommended the couple complete their orientation, like a very specific orientation provided by this company for this particular dive that's guided by an incredibly seasoned dive master. Mm -hmm. But either toxic masculinity or murder. (gasps) Gabe 
refused this offer. Probably mm. both. Oh, both. Mm-hmm. So mm. they went out on the water for day one of the expedition on October 22nd, 2003. The couple entered the water, but both returned to the surface pretty quickly because Gabe said that there was an issue with his dive computer and wanted it fixed before going back in. I don't fucking know what a dive computer is. I don't care. It's just some piece of equipment that probably like monitors your oxygen level, how much is in your tank, how deep you're going, like shit like that. I'm sure that's exactly what it is. And that's extremely important too. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sounds sounds Um, like it. Yeah. So like safety first or whatever. What happened next is kind of hard to pin down because Gabe Watson has given over 16 different versions of the story. (gasps) Ha! Ha! Yeah. What can be vaguely pieced together is this. Now, this is based on multiple accounts that he's made. This is sort of the, like, official story uh, pieced together from his accounts. But again, this will all come into question. So... Tina lost consciousness and sank to the bottom about 30 meters below the water's surface a few minutes after the couple re-entered the water. Gabe said the currents were stronger than they had expected and that Tina was spooked by the strength of the current and signaled him signaled to him to return to the dive rope, which is connected directly to the boat and is like your lifeline. Mm-hmm. He claimed that in her panic, she accidentally knocked his mask and air regulator loose from his face, completely obstructing his vision because everything filled with water. Mm -hmm. By the time he had fixed his mask and air supply, so basically put his mask on and then you have to like allow your air regulator to blow enough air into the mask to clear out all the water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Oh my God, I can't breathe. Oh, I know. Horrible. I've had to do that. Um, I went scuba diving, so I did all this stuff. It's fucking scary. And I hated especially that it was salt water. Yeah. I couldn't do it. It's it's not a fun situation. I can't even Um, snorkel. Fuck no. I can snorkel, but... You're, you have so much more control. You just pop up when you feel uncomfortable. Every this just five seconds. S- seconds. Yeah, this just feels, this is a little scary. That said, but, you know. scuba diving is really fucking fun if you're oh, comfortable so with cool. it. So fucking cool. Mm-hmm. And I mean, people manage to do it all the time without dying. Yeah. So like, go if for I it. I can't but scuba, anyway. what's it all been about? What's it all been about, <laughs> Creed? <laughs> Crush so by the, the time you had jokes. Fixed, I'm so proud. Always. <laughs> By the time he had fixed his mask and air supply, Tina was sinking fast, and he could not get to her. He went back up to the boat to get help, and according to Wikipedia, quote, he also stated that an ear problem prevented him from diving deeper to help her and that there was nothing in his training as a rescue diver about how to get somebody in trouble to the surface. How to rescue would- a diver. Literally, he, what is the point of rescue diver training if it doesn't teach you how to, I don't know, rescue someone? God. Wait, he, I, I must have missed that part that he had full on rescue diving training. Yeah, he had taken some rescue diving training. Not very extensive, but like had been through rescue diving training, like at a bare minimum. Jesus. And everyone when you dive is equipped with like emergency equipment where it's basically like a life vest that can fill with air that's like strapped around your waist that you or your diving buddy can activate for you that will lift you to the surface rapidly. And he didn't do this for her. Okay. Yep. Um, so even under the underwater, there are witnesses when you're on like a diving excursion in fucking Queensland. Um, but what's frustrating is that what some of these folks saw could corroborate his series of events. Mm -hmm. So according to a nearby diver, uh, Dr. Stanley Stutes, he saw Gabe engaged, various Stutes, Stutes. (laughs) He saw Gabe engaged in what he called an underwater bear hug with his flailing wife. After Mm. which he headed for the surface while Tina fell to the ocean floor. Another (sighs) close by diver, Gary Stempler actually got a photograph of Tina lying on the ocean floor for like basically lifeless while he was taking a picture of his own wife. Like he didn't even know she was in the background. And when these photos were developed a couple weeks later, like there she was at the bottom of the ocean. It's so because, fucking creepy. Because like the flash illuminated her that he like didn't see her. <gasps> well, I, he was just taking a photo of his own wife. It's on the drive. Like his wife is posing at the great barrier reef. reef. He's just like looking at his wife in a scuba suit and she is in the background. Oh my god! Yeah, you can see it's really eerie. That's her, like, d- dying on the at the bottom of the ocean. The sea snake. The sea snake. No, no. not the sea <gasps> snake. Oh my god! Ew! Ew! Yeah. 
I mean, it's not like graphic. It's just really creepy. It's really creepy. If you know what's going on, that picture is right. really disturbing. It's very disturbing. Um, so Gabe gets back onto the diving boat uh, and tells the lead guide, Wade Singleton, that his brand new wife, because, oh yeah, did I mention they have only been married 11 days at this point? God damn it. Marriage yeah. is hard, you know? <laughs> <laughs> just don't get married. Uh, was at the bottom of the dive site. So Singleton jumps to action. He dives in to retrieve her, taking her to a second boat at the site, which had a doctor aboard. Um, after she had been in the water unconscious for 10 fucking minutes. So it's already oh. not looking good. The doctor on that second boat tried to resuscitate her for 40 minutes while Gabe sat on the other boat. He didn't even come over to the boat to be with his wife who was being resuscitated by this doctor. Which I like, mean, I, uh, what the fuck? I, I mean, that's, I, I, that's probably because he's fucking guilty as sin, but one devil's advocate thing would be I could see not wanting to rock the boat. Ha 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 ha. Yeah. Well, and I like mean, <laughs> distract the person. Um, I get it. And I wrote here, like, I know that that behavior, that behavior is not always indicative of a crime committed, but this just really skeeved me out. I really didn't like that. And you also yeah. can never know what you would do in that situation. But right. if I were in that situation and I had not murdered my husband five minutes ago, I would probably be on the fucking boat with him while he's being yeah. resuscitated. Yeah, I would, I would it doesn't mean he's be... guilty, but it's just a little sketchy. Yeah. I don't like it. I don't like it either. Unfortunately, Tina Watson could not be revived. Mm. Um, an autopsy was performed the very next day in Queensland, Australia, where the coroner found florid evidence of air embolism, which is a blood vessel blockage caused by one or more bubbles of air or other gas in the circulatory system. And to continue with a lot of words I don't really understand, a la the bridge game explanation, yeah. <laughs> uh, diver, divers can suffer this as a consequence of lung overexpansion injury, breathing gas introduced into the venous system of the lungs due to pulmonary barotrauma will not be trapped in the al alveolar capillaries and will consequently be circulated to the rest of the body through the systemic arteries with a high risk of embolism. So it's basically like shit going through the lungs that shouldn't go through the lungs and into the bloodstream and killing you. And Thanks, a, Wikipedia. And like a bubble in your bloodstream, which is yeah. terrifying because it no seems good. like such a tiny thing and I don't understand why it doesn't happen more often. It because Because of lungs. Because of what uh, the lungs do. Because oh. of lungs. Because lungs. Because lungs. <laughs> uh, so cause the coroner lungs. officially ruled Tita's death a drowning. Now, if Gabe had not been a wishy-washy turd with his story, police may not have looked too much further into this. Mm -hmm. But alas, he was. And alas, they did. So while Gabe went back to the States and refused to return to Australia for further questioning, the Queensland police worked tirelessly at recreating the scene over and over again, trying to play this out in the way that he had described, using highly trained police divers, and shit was just not adding up. Mm. Gabe's version of events didn't line up with the data captured on his dive computer, and mm. police even suspected that Gabe intentionally turned off his dive computer turned off Tina's air regulator, Ugh. held her until she was unconscious, turned her regulator back on, let her sink to the bottom, turned his computer back on and darted to the surface. So that's why she was flailing and why he was mm -hmm. bear hugging her. Mm -hmm. Ish. Uh -huh. Exactly. Oh my the, God. Literally the next thing I have here is this would also line up with Dr. Stute saying that Gabe, that he saw Gabe giving Tina a bear hug while she flailed. And the question was, was this Gabe trying to calm his panicking wife or was this murder? Can you imagine being Tina in that moment and you're just no. on a fucking honeymoon doing this stupid hobby that your husband likes? Yep. That you're just playing along so that you can get back to the pool and read your uh -huh. goddamn book. Yep, you're Nora Ephron. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And all of a sudden, he's ripping out your air regulator and holding you, and you're uh -huh. trying to get away. I cannot. Uh huh. In front, in of, front of other of people e who don't really know what's going on because you can't hear shit down there. Yeah. So, unless they are paying close attention to you and they're like off exploring this ship and the fucking Great Barrier Reef, yeah. it's not completely out of the realm of possibility that people aren't really paying attention to what's happening over there. And then the people who did see it, 
it, it could be either way. Back up his his version of events where he's like, yeah, she was freaking out. I was trying to assist her. I lost a grip on her. She fell. I darted to the surface to get help. Aren't like, there like hand signals amongst scuba divers where it's like, yeah. help me. This is fucked up. Yeah. I, I mean, yes, there are, but she's also not a skilled diver. So, right. But you I know, mean, in your he panic, sh- he should have been signaling. He right. should have and done a, a lot of things. His negligence, right. considering the training that he had, is something that comes up like throughout right. his trial. Okay. Um, so Tina's family obviously suspected it was murder and her father even testified that shortly before the fatal honeymoon, which is the titular lifetime movie, um, Gabe had instructed Tina to increase her life insurance and make him the sole beneficiary. Mm, Now this could be, again, it could be circumstantial. They are newlyweds. And after you get married, folks will often make changes to like their financial, you know, to the beneficiaries of their insurance policies, whatever. But the increase in insurance is mm-hmm. definitely fishy. See what I did there? <laughs> mm, what a sea snake. Mm-hmm. He's such a sea snake. So investigations continued in Australia and in the U.S., including help from the FBI, for five fucking years. Mm, he's sunk. In the- In the course of that five years, suspicion of Gabe steadily increased. He behaved oddly, to say the least, doing shit like a shipwreck. He was a shipwreck. No, he he was definitely not a wreck. He was just kind of going about his life. His story didn't Um, hold water. It did not hold water. (laughs) But he did shit like remove flowers from Tina's grave, like right after family had laid them down. Not like getting rid of dead flowers and replacing them with new ones. Like seeing that a new wreath of flowers had been laid down there and being like, fuck this and taking it away. Okay. Well, if they were ugly blue carnations, then I understand. Maybe. Baby's breath. Oh. Um, he also tried to sue the diving company for 45 grand after the company's insurance refused to pay him out due to the ongoing investigation into Tina's death. And that $45,000 included quote, the accidental death plus compensation for trip interruption, medical expenses, phone calls, taxi fares, fees for extra credit card statements and unspecified punitive damages for mental and emotional anguish. So, like, dude was not keeping a low profile at all. Trip interruption. Yeah, exactly. His lawsuit was tossed out, rightfully so, in 2008. No one was going to pay him. Well, there's an open murder investigation against you. You shouldn't be able to collect fucking insurance. Correct. Mm -hmm. I Um, just went to my travel agent today booking a trip, and um, she told me... A scuba trip? A seven-day scuba scuba trip trip (laughs) with great whites? Uh, no, never. Thank God. And, um, she told me that they had, uh, someone who came to South Africa just for their honeymoon and they booked like an elaborate five-star chartered planes, like elaborate honeymoon trip, expensive. Mm -hmm. And they paid with American Express. And then a month after they left South Africa and went back to the States, they disputed the charges and said that they never went on the trip. And American Express refunded them the whole thing. And the travel agency (gasps) is just out all of this money. Oh, that's a good scam. Oh, that's fucking fraud. No, Lucy, bad. (laughs) Lucy, bad. (laughs) Oh, my word. You are such a monster. That's fucked up. Isn't that fucked? up so they're they're like bringing it to court but they're like i don't really know that there's that much we can do like we can't take on american express and he's right this dude is not in south africa and probably not coming back probably not yep Ugh, that sucks um but the most damning thing that gabe had done obviously would be the multiple reports that he'd given since the incident So the following is kind of just like an overview of some of these different reports he'd given, not all 16, because not all of them were like court or police reports. This covers people he talked to, like friends and family in the press and also like police statements. Mm -hmm. Um, And the following is an excerpt from the book, A Second Chance for Justice, which was written by Melbourne legal researchers and doctors Asher Flynn and Kate Fitzgibbon and is a deep dive, LOL, (laughs) into this fishy, LOL, case. (laughs) 
So, quote, there are some slight and some significant variations among the 16 accounts that Gabe has provided. However, it's across murky. Yeah, murky. <laughs> However, across these statements, as noted by the Queensland Assistant Director of Public Prosecutions, Brendan Campbell, SC, Gabe has consistently claimed that Tina indicated that she was in difficulty and they attempted to return to the access line. He was assisting her by holding her. There was then an incident where his mask and regulator were dislodged and Tina sank away from him and then he decided to surface. Gabe has claimed that after Tina gestured to him underwater, he began towing her by her arm and or her dive vest and or her hand. Again, that's different in every version he's given. Against the current, back towards the access line of the Yongala. Um, and the access line is the rope used by divers to descend and ascend from the Yongala to the ocean surface. Um, Gabe has explained that he turned and indicated for Tina to inflate her buoyancy control device, the BCD, and that's the thing I was talking about earlier, by pressing a button located on her scuba diving vest, which would Activate enable her to... water wings. Yeah, which would enable her <laughs> to quickly ascend to the surface, but for unknown reasons, she failed to do so. Gabe has claimed that at some point he turned towards Tina and she either grabbed hold of his mask or knocked his mask or he knocked his mask and regulator ajar, at which stage he let go of her to clear and readjust his mask and regulator or to clear and readjust his mask and put his alternate regulator in, referred to as the safe second. It was at this point that Gabe has said that Tina began sinking towards or downwards towards the ocean floor. He has explained that she was facing upwards with her eyes open and her arms stretched outwards towards the surface, which is terrifying, and that's how she was found. Jesus Christ. Um, Gabe has claimed that Tina was somewhere between two and four meters, five to ten meters, or at least an arm's reach away and below him. Again, all in different accounts, he said these things. He has described her as sinking at a pace which, despite wearing flippers, meant he was unable to reach her. Gabe has suggested... I will say, though, about all these different accounts is that he is describing motion and movement... Mm -hmm. So like when he's saying that he like pulled her towards him and it was by her arm, by her hand, by her vest, couldn't it have been all three as he's like pulling her closer? Sure. I mean, it's speculate wildly. Like, you know what I don't buy though, that even with his flippers and the rate at which she was sinking, I mean, part of your whole scuba setup means that you don't just drop to the bottom like a fucking rock. Sure. He's and got flippers. Uh, he could have caught up with her. And because they've had some basic training, she would know that she had that inflatable device affixed to her. Mm -hmm. And the problem is she was likely unconscious before she even started drifting to the bottom. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So she couldn't have activated it and he didn't float, like swim down to push the button for her. Yeah. And can't so, like, you give the, somebody your, your, Mouth thingy. Yes. Your oxygen thingy. I mean, thingy. you, yeah, you could. But even if, like, they, he had done the bare minimum of just activating her life vest to get her to the surface, she likely would have lived. Mm -hmm. It's like, even if you don't, even if he gave an, a perfectly precise version of the same story every time, he should have had enough training to have executed these things in the moment, and he didn't. And so, then he's also wishy-washing on, like, the details of what happened. What? So was he saying, like, I don't know, I was panicked? Or was he just, like... I, don't, I didn't see anything about him even saying that. I think he just kept, he just kept fucking saying this same shit over and over again. Mm. Um, so this continues to go on, saying, In other versions, Gabe has suggested that despite thinking of the various ways he could assist his wife, including removing Tina's weights and inflating his and or her BCD, that device, which would enable them to both ascend to the ocean surface quickly. He ultimately felt there was nothing further he could do to help Tina, so he decided to leave her and begin ascending alone to seek help. Okay, fuck you. Leaving her to yeah. die. To yeah. definitely to die. During his ascent to the surface, Gabe initially claimed that he approached two other divers, possibly of Asian descent, on the access line and attempted to seek their assistance without success. However, given the location of where Gabe ultimately resurfaced and that no witnesses support this version of events, it is now accepted that this did not occur, mm -hmm. that he didn't run into people and ask them for help. He um, was pretending, he was lying, yeah. or he was stalling for time. Right. 
Um, upon resurfacing, Gabe was seen signaling for help and was overheard saying, quote, she's gone to the bottom and she's disappeared. She's in trouble. So mm -hmm. the big, huge problem with all of this is that when Tina was brought to the surface, her regulator was still in her mouth. Her tank still had air and tests of her equipment indicated no faults with her equipment. She never should have been in a situation where air supply was compromised unless by an outside intervention. Mm -hmm. They're like, we cannot recreate a situation where this would just turn off and not work all of a sudden. This is so distressing. It's very odd. So just, after, ugh. yeah, yeah, it's very, it's the whole thing is fucking cringy. So after years of investigation, changing stories and sketchy behavior, Gabe Watson was finally indicted in Australia on June 19th of 2008 after the coroner released the following official statement. Quote, that on the 22nd day of October 2003 at the site of the historical shipwreck Yongala, 48 nautical miles southeast from the port of Townsville in the state of Queensland, David Gabriel Watson murdered Christina May Watson. Mm -hmm. Gabe managed to dodge extradition for six months before finally making his way to Australia to face trial. Apparently he went on his own finally. Okay. He, he of course, pleaded not guilty to first degree murder, but and what I can only imagine was some kind of sweet deal, did plead guilty of manslaughter. Mm. He was convicted in Australia and sentenced to four and a half years in prison. But don't worry, the rest of the sentence was suspended after 12 months. So he uh, went to prison for one year. That's it. Oh my God. Yep. The Queensland Director of Public Prosecutions, Tony Moynihan, SC, issued this statement. Quote, the decision to accept Mr. Watson's plea of guilty to manslaughter was made after a careful and thorough examination of the admissible evidence and was not taken lightly because people were fucking outraged. So obviously they had to make this statement. Yeah. Given the complex circumstantial nature of the case, Mr. Watson's admission that he breached his duty to render assistance to his wife ultimately meant that there was no reasonable prospect of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that he was guilty of murder. Yeah, so, I mean, I can see that. Like, yeah, this I is fucking he, infuriating. Yeah. But after all the last like two and a half years of going over cases on this show, it, this is how the court system fucking works. You not only have to get enough evidence to even bring a suspect to trial, but then you have to have a compelling enough argument based in evidence, like hard evidence to get a jury to convict beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see. I mean, I think he fucking did it, but yeah. do I know that he fucking did it beyond a reasonable no. doubt? No, because a lot of it is circumstantial. Like, that's just the truth. And, so, like, uh, I would, I fucking panicked having a snorkel on my face. So, yeah. God only knows what would happen if scuba diving. Exactly. So I think similar to the U.S., the Crown was more than willing to offer the deal because so much of the evidence presented was circumstantial that they couldn't be confident that he would be convicted at all. Right. And then he would walk without any consequences. So it's a super frustrating process, but we have to remember that, like, it exists for a reason so that right. someone who is innocent, right. you know, doesn't get put away on only circumstantial evidence wrongfully. So, like, I get it, Brendan but it's really Dassey. annoying. Yeah, Exactly. But it ain't over yet because Tina's home state of Alabama was not satisfied with the Australia Ooh. ruling. So the state requested full case deets from Australia so that they may bring charges against Gabe in Alabama on the grounds that the murder was planned while they were still in Alabama. Clever Does girls. that violate double jeopardy if the case was tried in another country? I don't think if it, yeah, I don't think yeah, it applies because it was never tried here. Law. That's and Australia, amazing. Australia consented to providing all of their information on the case under the condition that Alabama take the death penalty off the table. Since the death penalty is outlawed in Australia, they were like, we'll only send yeah. him back to the States to be tried there if you don't kill him. That's uh, true and of a Al lot of Alabama extradition. was like, tight. Yeah, yeah, so they agreed. And in 2010, Gabe was deported from Australia after serving his slap on the fucking wrist and sent to Alabama to stand an American trial for murder, kidnapping, and deception. Oh, I bet he wished he still had three and a half years in Australia. Well, don't get oh, too no. excited. Kidnapping. Uh, on November 25th, uh, 2010, he was deported to the United States and immediately arrested. But after being released on bail, the state scrambled to put together significant means to prosecute and fell short. No. Yeah. 
Alabama judge Tommy Nail ruled that evidence of Watson's behavior following Tina's death was inadmissible. Nail also blocked Tina's father from giving evidence regarding Watson's alleged attempts to increase Tina's life insurance. On uh, February 23rd, 2012, Nail acquitted Gabe for lack of evidence without the defense needing to present its case at all. Oh. Nail said that the state's evidence was sorely lacking and that the prosecution could not prove that Watson had any financial motive. So Gabe is now a free man who remarried before trials <gasps> even fucking ended. Oh. To a woman named Kim Lewis who looks shockingly like his deceased wife, Tina. Does she love friends. mountain climbing? Yep. Probably. <laughs> she loves God. hiking. They're still in current, remote she's areas. alive and they're still currently married. So he, he kept this one. So if you look on the drive, there's a photo labeled Gabe and Tina. So you can see like a good full frontal of what Tina looks like. It's just a face photo, but whatever. Gabe and Tina. Got it. Got oh it. my God. And then Gabe. there's another one that says Gabe and Kim. Whoa. Yeah. <gasps> she's just Tina with bangs. She's Tina yeah, too. Yeah, hundred fucking percent. It's Tina too. She's Tina. There's literally an article that I found this in, titled "Gabe Watson says new wife not a lookalike." <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> that's she the is. headline of that article. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, it's Gabe's real so creepy. Icky. I don't like him. Yeah, so this case pops up in the media a lot since it's quite famous, but obviously for this episode, the most important depiction of this case is in Lifetime's Fatal Honeymoon, mm -hmm. which aired in August of 2012. And of course, I put some stills on the drive. It is a fucking masterpiece. Mm -hmm. And that, Carol Joe and everyone listening, is my case. Nice. The truth Nicely lies beneath done. the surface. What, uh, what yeah. lies beneath? The truth. The truth. The truth. <laughs> okay. Um, I had heard that case before. It is uh, so amazing, but there were some facts in there that I did not realize, like the fucking mm -hmm. lookalike wife. Yeah. Yeah. So ah. weird. The visual so of her weird. sinking to the bottom with her eyes oh, open and so her disturbing. arms outstretched might be the most haunting thing that we've talked yeah. about ever. Nobody should fucking die like that. That's just, I mean, no one should die from murder. But like, mm -hmm. oh, what a way to go! I just poor baby. I it makes anytime you talk about drowning, it makes me have like panic, heartbeat, horrible. Like I just, oh, okay. The okay, only good well, thing is drowning. Lack of oxygen is supposed to like make you go into like a really peaceful state right before you actually die. Mm -hmm. mm. Silver lining, bright side, bright side. <laughs> Bright side, bright side. All right, bright side, bright side. Special thanks this week to our fan picker, Susanna Scruggs. Get it, Scruggs. You done Susanna, good, you, Susanna. Yeah. You really you, did. Don't you, you cry really for me. You really get us. Thank you, mm. Susanna. Don't you cry for us. Mm -mm. <laughs> Thank you also to Lizzie at five bucks a month. Lizzie, I bet you're a fan of Lizzo. Mm. Mm. You put the sing in singer. In single. Oh, yeah. Uh, Tom Acker. Uh, Acker. Hardly know her. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> so, I know. I blew that load really yeah, early. Yeah, you did. So I, can't, I can't lean on it for the rest of the fucking special thanks. Thanks a lot, Tom. <laughs> thanks a lot, Tom, for your $5 a month. And thank you, Zoe, no last name. Maybe it's my sister-in-law. Probably mm. not. Love you very much, Zoe. There's Zoe way to know. There's Zoe way to know. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, Alex Alamar. Uh, mm. You make me want to go to the Alamo. Oh, Alex Alamar, my white Texas you make rose. Want a mm. Malamar bar? Mm. Yep. Uh, thank you, Aaron Pancakes. Jesus Christ, I'm so hungry. No more food names. <laughs> you know how hard it is to read food names at the end of a two-hour recording? <laughs> Thanks a lot, Aaron. But actually, thank you so much. We love you. I have every single one of Amanda's is going to end I'm so with, mad. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. She's cranky. <laughs> All right, She's thank angry. You. Thank you to Stevie Jaeger. I will never, ever be drinking Jaeger ever again, but I will be oh. thanking Jaeger. Stevie I don't know Jaeger. who I was at a bar with recently, but we were talking about 
Starry Nights, which are Jaeger and uh, Goldschlager shots. Ooh. Oh. What? Yeah. No. Thanks the a lot, Stevie. Is real. <laughs> God. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Victoria Huerta. I'm Horton for your <laughs> five bucks a month. Thank you very much, Victoria. Bless you. Uh, thank you to two rambling sisters. Your name's making me really miss my sister, so thanks a lot, <laughs> two rambling sisters. Don't force it. <laughs> oh, I'm forcing it. I committed to this. It's happening now. You're all getting angry shout-outs from me for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> Thank you, Heather Tinter Musakia. I Musakia <laughs> for a name pronunciation guide because <laughs> I did not nail it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you didn't provide one. That was amazing, Heather. Sounds God like a coffee you. drink, and I love it. Mm-hmm. Thank you, also, Laura Huber. Uh, I Laura the Explorer, you're Aww. you're exploring our the depths of our hearts with your five dollars a month. <laughs> the funeral home in my small town was the Huber Funeral Home. Oh yeah, it's beautiful. It, was. it still is. All right, it's still there. All right, yeah. Thanks a lot, Karina Stewart. <laughs> now you're just making me want to watch that movie, Karina, Karina, and I don't oh. have it on DVD, and I don't know where to stream it. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's true. Thanks a lot. I need some oh, I really Goldberg. do want to watch it. It's such okay. a good movie. I know, me movie. too. <laughs> okay, is it my turn? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Kirsten Mudrick. We are not going to mudrake your name. Kirsten. <laughs> in the world? <laughs> what in the world did you just say? Mud rake. Like Lucy mud gets, your name? That's a thing. Lucy gets mud raking is a thing. It's, okay. yeah, never mind. Leave it's peeping. political. You wouldn't get it. <laughs> You're right. I wouldn't and don't. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Alexis Roger. Roger that. We mm. are hereby indebted to you. We'll buy you some mozzarella sticks next time we see you. Mm. Mm-hmm. I get all the ones that are hard to be mad at. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, makeup nerds. <laughs> you reminded me that I don't have any makeup on today, and now I need to go put on makeup so I can feel better about myself. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Oh, my God. My neighbors must think I'm insane. I am screaming. This is the sanest thing you've probably screamed from your apartment all week. His dick fell off. Yeah. Makeup nerds. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> The way the criminal justice system works in Australia is fucking (laughs) deplorable. Get it together, (laughs) Queensland. And then his next wife. Oh. (laughs) Okay. Thank you to Heather Hovey. We lovey you, Heather Hovey. Hovey cow. Hovey. Hovey. Holy shit. Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. Thank you a lot. Thank you a lot, Sav. <laughs> you are you are moisturizing our knuckles throughout the winter. Oh. We can, <laughs> you are a calming balm. Oh, no. you are the soothing ointment. You're just uh-huh. what we need. Uh how do I get angry at this person? Uh, I got one. I got one if you need one. Go. Take it take it away. Thanks, Thanks a, lot, a lot, Caitlin Sanders. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Caitlin Sanders. Now you made me think about Colonel Sanders, and I'm really hungry I'm and I want KFC. <laughs> I'm starving. I literally had fried chicken yesterday, and now all I want is fried chicken. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Caitlin Sanders. And you know what? Thanks a lot, Kenyon. Because I hadn't even made that connection, and now well, I have, and now I actually am angry. You're welcome. Amanda hangs up. <laughs> <laughs> you're on hey, your own now. <laughs> thank you, Carmen. We don't have to search the world for you. Carmen San Diego, because you are following us. <laughs> <laughs> Th- 
Thank you, Mercy Yoho. Merci. Making me want some yo Yoho over ho, here. Yo ho. Nice. You and only a bottle of live rum. once. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> you only <laughs> holler once. <laughs> we All here right. for you. <laughs> we here for you. Thanks a lot, Purple Fox, for increasing your purple. donation for one to five dollars a month. And now all I want for a pet is a little purple fox, but they don't even exist. Thanks a lot. Just get one and diet like everyone else. That's God. inappropriate. <laughs> Thank you, Megan Reingart. <laughs> you're, you're gunning straight for our hearts. Your Rheingarten is lush with giving spirit. Well, welcome to mine Rheingarten. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. Yikes. That was awful. I loved it. Ich habe eine Klaubfuß. Gluten free. Ich habe eine no clue. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, speaking of gartens, Andrea <laughs> Farmer increased their pledge from $1 to $5 a month. We always love a good increase. Andrea mm -hmm. Farmer, if you need if you need a good backhoe, give me a call. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. All right. Thanks a lot, Lisa Elizabeth, for increasing your donation from $1 to $5 a month. At Lisa, you should have sent candy to me. <laughs> good. I don't know. I'm so tired. <laughs> I don't want to be angry anymore, but I've committed to this. You're in too deep. <laughs> I'm in so deep. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. Not our Amanda. Dear no, God, no one's not thanking her. me. <laughs> yeah. Definitely not for, Amanda. <laughs> for kicking off our $10 a month tier, you're going to be getting a fucking patriarchy wine glass in the mail at some point. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you also, Ashley Cappuccino. Fun mm. anecdote, when Canyon and I were in Italy, <laughs> I fully thought the word cappuccino just meant, like, small, like, a little bit. So oh, I asked no. the bartender to turn the music down, uno cappuccino. No, no, you did not. <laughs> and I think he thought I was ordering a cappuccino. Why would he think that? It didn't translate. I didn't bother <laughs> learning any Italian in the week and a half that we were there. So thank you a lot more than a little bit, Ashley Cappuccino. Mm. <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jessica Miles, for reminding me that I want to be miles away from where I am right now. <laughs> Rude. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Kelsey. No last name. Because we can see that you don't need it. Thank you, Kelsey. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay M. Harrison. I can only assume the M stands for Madonna. Murder. Oh. Mm. Yes, murder. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks, Lindsay. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Beth Bray, for reminding me that Lucy and I used to go into chat rooms when we were teenagers <laughs> and pretend to be rhinoceroses. And now I really miss when we were kids and I'm mad about it. We just it. had a, zoo a, a zookeeper kink. Yeah, we mm -hmm, did. Mm -hmm. Oh, Thank early you, kinks. Heidi Coons. You sound Coons. like a pretty coon gal. Ooh. Yeah. You, we, couldn't love you any more than we already oh do. Oh, my God. <laughs> Make me want to yodel. All right. Thank you, Geneva Writer Terio. Rooter Tyrol? Tiro? Tyrolt? Make me want to turn up my stereo. <laughs> Roto Rooter. <laughs> but I don't have a, a computer, an internet router. <laughs> my oh, router God. is broken, reset my so router. I have to listen to my stereo. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> it was amazing. 
Thank you, Shelby Holman. Thanks a lot for reminding me that I want to be held by a man. <laughs> You but want I'm a man in your so hole. Alone. A whole man? Or just half a, a man? A whole man. <laughs> it's so lonely in this room. Part, part man. man. Whole man. <sighs> oh, thank you, Elia Cummins. We love you coming or going. Thank you, Elia Cummins. <laughs> uh, okay. Also at 10 bucks a month, receiving that sweet, sweet wine glass, Morgan Merritt. Mm. You you have earned the merit to get a, um, a wine glass because you're donating yeah. at ten dollars a month. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you merit it. Turns out I don't know how to use the word merit in a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> nope, no one does. Uh, there's no way to know. Thank, uh, my throat is getting sore from yelling <laughs> yeah, at all these people. Here sound we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Liz Harrington, for reminding me how much I hate pickled herring. <laughs> and now I'm like ghost tasting pickled herring in my mouth. Enjoy your trash. You also qualify for the trash queen level. Thank you. I love pickled herring. Oh my God. Ew. What? Ugh. It would literally kill me. Thank you, Abby Haynes. You are also a trash queen or king or neither or both, and you make us happy. Mm. <laughs> Wait till we get our Haynes on you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Brittany Rivera. Uh, don't go scuba diving in any R- Rivera's because your uh-huh. husband might kill you. Yeah. Thank you, And Brittany. don't go chasing waterfalls. Oh, <laughs> stick to the Riveras and the lakes that you're used to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thanks a lot, Cody <laughs> Chir- Chirwanka, <laughs> for making me really want to watch Willie Chirwanka and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> and the Chir Chocolate Factory. And the Chir Chocolate Factory. <laughs> Damn it. How could you? <laughs> <laughs> I only have one more of these that I have. Let's do this. Thank you, Tabby Brady. You are the best trash king or queen or neither or both or kitty cat ever. <laughs> oh, Tabby, Tabby Brady. You're the missing Love Brady it. bunch, kitty. Mm-hmm. Thank you to V Arrow. You've hit the bullseye with your $25 a month. So send us your episode or topic or wine pick and or. Mm -hmm. When you get a minute, Mm -hmm. we'll throw you on the Mm -hmm. calendar. We'll shoot you Mm -hmm. right on the calendar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. Last one. And thanks a lot, Dustin Curbo Coplin, for your once-off donation, which reminds me that all of my exes were afraid of commitment. <laughs> and if you are like one of them, you can make once-off donations at our online store, winecrimepodcast.bigcartel.com. Maybe they weren't afraid of commitment. Maybe they weren't. Maybe they were just right about me. Maybe once was enough. <laughs> <laughs> we love Amanda. We feel sorry for her vocal cords. She's we gonna go. Love you. You. She's gonna go drink some tea. I need a hot toddy. <laughs> a hot tabby. Thank you so much. See you next we'll talk week. To you next week. <laughs> bye bye. Thanks for listening to Wine and Crime. Our cover art is by Kali Yip. Music by Phil Young and Corey Wendell. Editing by Jonathan Camp. Check out our website and blog at wineandcrimepodcast.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at wineandcrimepod. If you have questions, answers, or recommendations to share, email us at wineandcrimepodcast at gmail.com. Episodes are available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, basically wherever you get your podcasts. Most importantly, if you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. It really is the best way to spread the word. If you'd like to show your support and get a shout out on air, visit our Patreon page to keep this podcast and the wine flowing. Cheers! I'm Kelsey. And I'm Riley. And you're listening to Pilot Light, the podcast where two gal pals celebrate their love of weed, snacks, and TV. Join us every Weed Wednesday at 420 Eastern Standard Time for our new episodes. We are just two wee nerds who winging are it. <laughs> winging it. I need to light that again. I got you. Good, because I lost my lighter again. Because I'm holding it. I can't actually eat a pint. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna. Like, have you had their butterbeer? Mm-mm. 
Hold on while I cleanse my palate. Oh my god. Right, shut up, right? Check out our website, pilotlights.com. That's P I L O T L I T E S dot com. Don't forget to go check out the link to our Patreon too, where you can get access to exclusive content, our secret Facebook groups, raffles, and more. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can. In the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member of DIC.